Um, all right, so it is just turning 7 o'clock, and I would like to welcome everyone to the uh, regular council meeting of October 1st, 2018. And uh, Judy, if you could uh, please do the roll call. Yes, Housh. Yes. McQueen. Here. Stokes. Here. Krieger. Here. Uh, council member Hempfling is out of town this evening. Also present is village manager Patty Bates, um, finance director Colleen Harris, and I think we got it. All right, great. Oh, I'm sorry. Village solicitor Chris Conner. All right, yes. Welcome, Chris. Um, so we have a couple of special announcements, and then we'll get to our general ones. So uh, the first one is uh, NECCO. NECO, is that all right? And if you could come to the microphone, please. Okay, good evening. I won't be before you guys long. I have a cold, so sorry. <laughs> but I'm with NECO. We're a foster care agency out of Dayton. Uh, we have an office in Dayton, one in Cincinnati, and then another one in South Point, Ohio. And so what we do, we are a foster care agency. We do foster to adopt, and then we also offer counseling. Um, our goal is, um, as far as reaching out to the city councils in the Dayton metro area, is to just get awareness out about who we are and what we do. Um, we've been working with local churches um, in Beaver Creek and Zinia and in other areas around Dayton. Um, as well as local businesses, um, whether it's a partnership for us to come out and to speak to the churches in the area, the youth groups like the Y in the area. Um, even we are working with the Dayton Public Schools, so we go around to the elementary schools and speak with the parent on PTA nights. And so um, we're just looking to make a partnership with um, Yellow Springs as well, because like I said, we do want to cover all our bases and all the areas that are um, in our community. And so that's just why we wanted to come out tonight and just make you guys aware of who we are, whether it's just leaving a flyer at a local business, partnering up, um, just coming to the city council meetings, or whatever it may be for us to get the parents that we need for our kids. Thank okay, you. Thank you. I, Thank I have a question. Yeah. How can, do you have flyers that you could leave or how could people get in touch with you? I do. I have flyers um, in the back with our cards. Um, it has my name, um, our program director, Dana Atkins, and also our um, home resource coordinator, um, Brianne. And so all of our cards are in there, all our information. Our, um, our website is easy access, it's neco.org. And so it's pretty easy to access us. If you look up foster care in Dayton, we're one of the first ones to come up. So we're not hard to find, but it's always great to get out and just get our name out there so the community knows who we are. And there is a shortage of foster care homes right now, correct? Yes. Um, in Dayton alone, we have about 800 kids just in Montgomery County that are in the foster care system. Um, some of them are through us, and the rest of them are through the county directly. A lot of those kids out of those 800 plus do not have homes right now, so that is my job and what I'm looking to do. And like I said, that's just Montgomery County just in general. We um, cover every county in Ohio. Our basic um, office, our Dayton office, we go an hour each way, so we go to Columbus, we go to the borderlines of Cincinnati. We even have families that are from Lima who uh, foster through us as well. So we cover a wide range. All right, okay. thank, you. thank you. Yeah, so uh, it sounds like we will definitely have your brochures um, here at the village. And, uh, you know, I would say if you ha want some other opportunities to talk, um, maybe you could um, interact with our clerk, Judy Kittner. Uh, mm -hmm. I think she would have some great ideas for you. Thanks. All right, Jeff Brock, please come to the mic. Good evening, everyone. I'm here representing Green Memorial Hospital. And you'll note in the handout, which I'm assuming Judy distributed to you, yes, great, uh, that I uh, just want to share a few thoughts about Green Memorial. We are here to improve the communities we serve. Yellow Springs is one of those communities. And we are also collaborative, so we think it important to inform folks of the way we're serving residents in their uh, villages and cities and across the county. So I'll take just a few moments to talk through some of the highlights in this handout that you can use as a reference, as a summary. And I'm sorry to all my friends out here that I didn't provide one for you, but hopefully you'll find some good information as well. Uh, we appreciate you and all you do for Yellow Springs. <coughs> and. Uh, we have some of our staff who live here in Yellow Springs, and they love their experience here, so thank you for taking care of them as well. 
We're often asked how the hospitals are doing, and I say hospitals because I will make reference to Soin Medical Center as well, because you folks are equidistant between both hospitals, and your residents uh, enjoy privilege at both. Uh, you see there by the numbers that we have quite a footprint in the county for both hospitals, but for Green Memorial, we have pretty extensive deep footprints, and you can see by the statistics that we serve more than 120,000 through Green Memorial and its services. Mm -hmm. And most are unaware that Green, smaller than Soin by uh, a good stretch, serves as many patients as Soin does across the county. Mm -hmm. Some hear that Green is just a 49-bed hospital, and you see Soin is listed at 127 beds, but Green was uh, intentionally made a 49-bed hospital so we could better offer services across the county in the rural parts of our county. Medicare prefers us to be a rural hospital, so for that reason we have to be 49 beds or under in order to offer better services out amongst the county. And Yellow Springs is one of the locations of our rural health clinic, clinic mm -hmm. along with Cedarville, and we have services also in Beaver Creek and Fairborn. So even at that, at 49 beds, we have a deep footprint when it comes to the inpatient and outpatient care. Yellow Springs is served by both. And we know that uh, folks here, some enjoy the smaller setting at Green, and others prefer to go towards Soin, but I can tell you that the care is equal at both places. And how can I say that? Because we are rated several ways by Medicare and across other certifications, but Green recently was recognized as being in the top 10% of hospitals nationwide for patient safety. Green and Soin were both recognized at that level. So if you think of 5,800 <coughs> hospitals across the nation, Green and Soin are in the top 10%, and we think that's good for this county. I've also shared with you some of the services we offer, and it's mostly a reminder because uh, we've shared this before across the county, and many are familiar with what we do at Green, but both hospitals offer level three trauma centers, which is unique to a county to have both of its hospitals at that level, which means that those in any part of the county have opportunity to receive quick care and good care for those emergency services. And you can see we offer a lot of significant outpatient, and that's why we have so many who take advantage of our services there as well, particularly with cardiac therapy and physical therapy, which are countywide services at Green Memorial. So for this reason, I come before you not only to share the report, but we have an issue on the ballot, which we do every two and three years. We have two levies that serve the hospital, and this is the second of the two. It's a 0.5 mil levy, and uh, this one has been on the ballot for about 25 years. The original levy has been on the ballot for 70 years, and we've been privileged that the county has said yes to these each time we've come onto the ballot. Uh, I always point out that Green serves 120,000 patients, and this year we are poised to serve even more this year. And uh, with a county population of 164,000, that tells you how many in this county to take advantage of some service of green in some part of the county. This covers especially emergency cardiac and women's services uh, who need that type of care within minutes. Our emergency department will serve about 23,000 this year. And if you think uh, the majority of those come from Xenia, we still have eight to 9,000 that come from outside Xenia for service in Green Memorial. So this levy is no tax increase. I emphasize that several times when folks ask me about this issue, and it costs approximately $15 annually per $100,000 of property value. Some recent additions at Green, we're now certified as a stroke-ready hospital, which means that any who face that circumstance, within minutes they can find the highest quality of care at Green Memorial. And we are the first to receive that designation here in Ohio, which is a pretty good thing for what I call little old green. We also have improved our emergency department to better serve patients and make for a quicker door-to-doc -to -doc time. We've expanded cardiology, added equipment to support there, and added equipment to support our intensive care unit, which is still vital to having it green to serve this part of the county. So there I speak to how the levy dollars are used. I point out that they're used solely at Green Memorial. And we have by contract with the commissioners of this county to report quarterly to them how we spend those levy dollars. And we sit down with them and work through the operating budget of the hospital so they can see how those monies are used. 
So with that, I end these remarks. Thank you for supporting us. We are pleased to support you and count you as neighbors. And we do look forward to being out here in about a week to be a part of your street fair, which we've done for several years. So thanks. And if there are any questions, I'll be happy to entertain those. Okay. Any questions? Thank you. We appreciate thank, it. Yeah, thank you, welcome. Jeff. Yeah, keep You're up welcome. the good work. Thank you for supporting us. All right. And good luck on Sunday. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, other announcements? Lisa, I know you, you were going to mention something. I do. I want to announce the uh, first ever Yellow Springs Porch Fest. It's this Saturday. Uh, there's going to be 38 bands spread across uh, 20 Yellow Springs porches. It starts at around noon. Uh, there is a map online at uh, www.ysporchfest.com. Um, this was uh, born out of a Yellow Springs Art and Culture Commission meeting. It's locally sponsored. It's local musicians. Um, yeah, nonprofit. It should be a really fun uh, local event. So I hope you can all participate. There's every kind of music from um, string or in wind quartets to, you know, metal. So <laughs> something for everybody. There is, uh, maybe, yeah. And it's from noon to seven, so it ends quite early. Yeah. And, and there was a flyer in the paper. Yeah. That's true. There was a flyer in the paper. It's easy to get. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Any other announcements from council members? Marianne? Well, I, you know, sometimes it's hard to know if it's a petition, communication, or an announcement. Mm. But I'll say this is an announcement. Okay. Some people may remember that about three or four years ago, the Human Relations Commission worked on a resolution in which Yellow Springs changed Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day. Mm -hmm. Yellow Springs does not take that as a holiday. I mean, the, the village government continues to work and schools, I think, are Schools, schools they are in still in session, yeah. But uh, it was felt that it was much more impro appropriate to honor the indigenous peoples. And actually, it's by saying indigenous peoples, the idea is not just indigenous peoples in North America, but really worldwide. And we consulted with people, uh, indigenous people, several, who, who all agreed that that was the best way to do it. So next Monday, October 8th, is Indigenous Peoples Day. I'm glad you mentioned that. Actually, uh, that inspired me a couple years ago with Rails to Trails Conservancy. We were still doing federal holidays, and so Columbus Day would show up on my timesheet, and we changed that. <laughs> and so, and I shared our resolution, and I, I think it's a really important thing, uh, an important statement. Um, I do want to mention, um, uh, Jeff brought up Street Fair, October 13th. In particular, I want to flag that the um, Yellow Springs Clifton Connector Project will have a booth. So um, we, we had this uh, um, map out when the Clifton Arts and Culture Festival or Arts and Music Festival happened a couple uh, weeks ago. And um, this is also going to be a sneak peek for some of the um, uh, renderings for the Yellow Springs Active Transportation Plan that I think many of you know has been in progress. So uh, they've committed Tool Design Group who's been working with us to having those renderings, those diagrams, so you can get a sneak peek of that, see what's going on with the connector project. Um, the other thing is, Judy, I, the um, uh, Ohio Municipal League uh, notice about um, that that actually Kevin had shared that I had thought we were going to have in the packet. This was the one that talked about um, there's legislation on the state level right now to, um, I guess, uh, peel back on uh, punishments for uh, drug violations and doesn't look familiar, sound familiar. Um, Kevin, do you want to say something about that? Because, uh, I mean, there was sort of a call for municipalities to support that. Yeah, so I think the, a, a simple way to look at it is um, I think the merits of, um, of the issue are clear, and I think we all support them. Um, I mean, I can't list them all. I don't have the list in front of me. But, um, you know, reducing sentences for certain charges 
um, if you look at, uh, listen to some of the uh, political campaigns, uh, you know, Cordry is for, you know, this issue and this uh, competition is not. Um, and, and I think the, the clear line of demarcation is whether, not whether anyone supports um, these changes. I support the changes, but I'm, I'm questioning whether it should be um, a state constitutional change as opposed to just a change through the Ohio Revised Code. So the Ohio Municipal League, <coughs> excuse me, is encouraging uh, municipalities to um, you know, create resolutions in support of reconsidering the changes, not as a change to the Constitution, but as a change to the Ohio Revised Code. One would imagine, well, first of all, you know that changes to the Constitution are, are hard. They're difficult uh, to, to come about. Um, and with the way uh, maybe the pendulum is swinging with um, charges for certain types of uh, drug offenses, and just as an example, um, I think we as a state ought to try to remain a bit more nimble in being able to change the way we deal with uh, drug offenses, for example, down the road. Um, so again, what they're saying is, what Ohio Municipal League is saying is that they support the merits of the of the ballot initiative, they just don't think it should be um, a, an amendment to the Constitution as opposed to changes to the Ohio Revised Code. Okay. So I want to. I guess I wanted to make sure that just was flagged so that that's um, in our next packet. And Marianne, you had a couple other announcements. Oh, yeah, I think these are more announcements than communication. So Denise Swinger, who is our planner has, um, I guess, are these new hours? Yes. Established? Yes. Walk-in hours from 10 to 2. So mm -hmm. Denise will be in her office from 10 to 2, Monday through Friday. Mm -hmm. And if you have questions about planning, need help uh, mm -hmm. building a yeah. house or yeah. a fence or whatever, she will be there. She, those are, yeah, those are the walk-in hours. She's there other hours by appointment, but those are the walk-in hours where you don't have to have an appointment and you can, you just, can just come in. Come okay. In. And lastly, beggar's night, I would call it Halloween, but beggar's night will be uh, Wednesday, the 31st of October from 6 to 8 p.m. in Yellow Springs. I'm surprised Patty didn't say. She always says every year, as long as she's village manager, it will always be, be October. On yes. yes. All right. October and, 31st uh, from On the real day. That's on right. the day. Yes. It alleviates a lot of confusion this, if this everybody is, I guess has this it is on the, the same day. day. No. See? Your last Unless things change. Unless okay. things change. Yeah. Um, and then, Patty, I think you have one other announcement. I do have one announcement. Uh, earlier today, Officer Richard Neal resigned his position with the Yellow Springs Police Department. Great. Okay, uh, so with that, we're going to move into the consent agenda. And um, we just have one thing, which is the minutes from the September 17th meeting. And I'll entertain a motion to approve. I move that we approve the minutes. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Uh, review of the agenda. Anything that we need to add, change, move around? Okay. If not, uh, Marianne, petitions and communications? Yes. So we had two communications from uh, Lori Fox at the County Health Department. One is about a collaborative organization called Community Coalition that's doing, among other things, community gardens. And another is a, a citizen alert that the West Nile virus has been found at five points in some water with mosquitoes uh, in Fairborn. So be, be cautious about, you know, wearing whatever you need to wear and not getting bit by mosquitoes. Because that would not be fun. To Mm -hmm. um, Patty Bates. Tilly Roundup. Roundup. Mm -hmm. Do you, you want me to? Yeah. Okay. So this is just a reminder that the Utility Roundup program is coming very soon. Um, we have received permission from the state auditor to establish the line to take the donations. Um, so I believe Colleen has set a date for next Monday. 
um, to begin accepting those donations. So as you, if like I, got your bill today, if you want to start rounding up when you pay that, please just wait until next week and then pay your bill. You'll still have a week to do that if you want to round that up. You can also uh, make donations at the utility window if you so choose. But beginning on Monday, October 8th, we will begin taking donations for the Utility Roundup program. And we hope to start disbursements of uh, assistance through that program in January. And Patty, excuse me. I, I looked at, I got my bill today. Mm -hmm. There's nothing on the bill. Is it, the yeah. new form come out next time? We're going to have a couple of cats saved um, for the next month. That okay. will, um, if, could, why don't you come up, Colleen, so that the folks at home can hear you and Spencer catches on mic. So we were waiting for the auditors to give us the approval and we got the verbal. So we are moving ahead with the utility company and they have drafted our invoice mm -hmm. uh, that we'll be sending out to everyone. It probably won't be on the next bill. Only a few we're going to select and test mm -hmm. to make yeah. sure it works. However, if anybody wants to still donate, they can handwrite on the bill, I would like this amount to go into mm -hmm. the utility roundup fund. So yeah. we will be able to start receiving that yeah. in. So between the end of October's bill and November, it should be um, on there. You do have to call and sign up for it. It will only be on the people's invoices that they want us to automatically round up. It's an opt-in. It's an opt-in. We, we didn't expect to receive the, the approval back from the state quite yet. No. So. Um, but we can accept the donations after next Monday. So just write it on your bill and we'll go from there. Thanks. And, and I would just like to encourage folks out there to um, consider the importance. We've done a lot of uh, things to make lives better for folks with respect to utilities or certainly have spent a lot of effort attempting to do so. Uh, but January, We'll be here soon, and soon after January, or soon after the 1st of January, we will begin dispersing these funds. But um, just wanted to encourage you that just the roundup, where you're rounding up to the next dollar, that alone will not uh, provide us with, uh, I think, enough money to be able to address some of the needs that we anticipate uh, being presented with the 1st of next year. So I would encourage those of us who can and are willing to to make those extra dollar donations, however you do it, whether it's on the bill or come down and uh, donate in person, please do so that, so that uh, we can have enough money in the fund uh, when uh, we want to start dispersing, that we have enough to be able to meet the needs, uh, again, that are presented to us. Please and thank you. All right. Okay. So a couple more communications. Senator Hackett sent us a letter of congratulations uh, for our new water plant that had its ribbon cutting. Well, I was not in town. A couple weeks ago. Couple weeks ago. Yeah. And we got a little note from Jason and Margaret Morgan, who used to live here and have moved, thanking the utility office staff for their mm -hmm. help and professionalism and friendliness. And the last thing from Jim Hammond, did you want, you, shall we leave that for the next meeting because it didn't get into the packet or Patty, do you want to? Um, well, I, I, I did look at Mr. Hammond's um, correspondence and I did, um, I did write a response that is out on the table. Um, so um, I, I appreciate Mr. Hammond, Mr. Hammond bringing the information to us. Um, there are a few differences between what I did and what he did, um, first, his or businesses, I'm, I'm looking for my, uh, my brief that I wrote. Um, that, I found it. Okay. Yeah. Um, so Mr. Hammonds or businesses, um, we don't have the additional pages. Brian had asked one question was, can we do the same full analysis? Well, no, because we don't have the additional pages that have the information on it. But um, I was doing residential rates. Mr. Hammond provided businesses. Um, I don't believe that Mr. Hammond's are all green energy. The one, of course, you know, in the village is, but I don't believe the other one is green energy. It's probably more of a coal powered. Um, I don't know if Mr. Hammond has a variable rate or if he has negotiated a lower rate with DPNL, which I know some businesses are able to do. 
So there are a lot of unanswered questions as to the difference between the two. Um, I will also point out that DPNL has a 520,000 customer base and we have 2,000. Um, so um, this, this brief is out on the table along with Mr. Hammond's correspondence. So anyone is... And I guess uh, as we're looking at the electric thing, we can just keep these communications. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think ultimately what, if we're going to have a complete uh, comparison uh, we need to have the, I guess, the full uh, charges that Patty referred to. But ultimately, I think when we look at this, we're also going to have to think about the, uh, the service that you get mm -hmm. in terms of having a, uh, uh, a village crew who's able to be called upon 24-7. Um, so I think it's, it's something to explore further. And maybe when we have a little bit more information, we can... Uh, uh, clarify some of those points yeah because I know that even when we call DPNL to come out and help our crews on something we have to wait several hours for them right so right and Jim did you want to say something mm -hmm. come on up I, th I think it's okay so because I I do want to like resolve this so all right Jim Hammond I'm with Mills Park Hotel um, I can answer these questions I, I you know, Patty states that these are, that our charges and DPNL charges are basically the same, and the coal power thing. I, you guys want to address affordability in the village, and that goes for residential and businesses mm -hmm. at the same time. Affordability to you know, run a business in town or live here. Um, in Xenia, the, the the bills I submitted, you don't need the back. You don't need the readiness for service charge, the taxes, the delivery charge. You don't need that. I gave you the, my, I gave you my bill that shows the, what I paid, what I wrote the check for, and how many kilowatt hours I got. That's, that's the bottom line. That's all anybody cares about. How much do I owe for how many kilowatt hours? So 14.9 cents a kilowatt hour at the hotel is what I'm paying. Regardless of the delivery and the who and the what and the taxes, and Xenia, I'm paying 6.9 cents, and that's a 36-month contract that we negotiated because we're a high user, but it's the same, it's about the same usage as the hotel. And it's not coal, it's an equal nuclear, gas, coal, 5% green. It's a mixture of stuff to AEP. That's the business side of it. So you can spin this however you want, but this is what it costs. And you want businesses to come to the um, industrial park the first thing they're going to look at is what's the power going to cost. And it's, you're talking over two times as much. They're not coming. They're not going to put a manufacturing facility out there. And then on the residential side, my daughter lives on East Dana Road. My mother lives on Hyde Road. You can almost see from one house to the other. My mother, AEP, 10.1 cents a kilowatt hour is what she's paying totally. And my daughter's paying 14.5 cents. The difference is 62. If my daughter was could switch to to uh, DPNL and AEP, she'd save $62 on that bill for a month. Well, that's a lot of money in a year. You guys want to address affordability and round up your, you know these bills and stuff, but this is a lot of money. And DPNL does a pretty good job of delivering the power, and AEP and all these other places. You can shop around and get any kind of power you want. But if you're running a business and, you, and you're concerned with, with your bills, you should be able to buy whatever power you want. And Yellow Springs shouldn't really have a monopoly on this thing. So thanks for your uh, rebuttal to my communication, but you're, you're way off. Well, the, the one thing that, that you bring up is that the village is, is fully committed to green energy and that the contracts that we've entered into, we're obligated to honor. So does that right raise the price? Yes, it does. You're right, but it's a commitment that the village council made many years ago and entered, in, entered into these contracts, and we have to honor them. But the villagers should be able to pick for themselves at this point. These contracts can get, you can get out of these contracts. I don't know how long they are or what they cost, we, but if well, DPNL okay, actually, offered a lot of money for our infrastructure, if they were to buy our infrastructure, the amount of money they would pay for that could be you know, invested in, and bring a lot of interest money into the village and and then the villagers could buy the green energy if they want or they can buy s nuclear coal gas solar whatever they want all right so jim i'm gonna 
uh, say thank you. And uh, um, yeah, I, I, it's it's not apples to apples. It's not that simple. Um, but I, I well, um, but we will. I think put together uh, something that explains our contracts and everything else. Um, yeah, we can't just put our electric grid up for sale, and I'm not sure that that's what the village wants anyway. But I think that the feedback's important, and we are uh, considering it. So, thank you. All right, thank you. Um, okay, so we're going to move into uh, public hearings and legislation. And uh, Judy, first of all, we've got the second reading of ordinance. I'm sorry, I forgot. Oh, the safety award. Well, let's do that first yeah. then. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So American Municipal Power is that what AM? Yes. Has awarded our <coughs> village crew with a transmission and distribution safety award for 2018. And. Yep, this is very cool. Yeah, the and congratulations to the staff. They do they do monthly safety training um, to make sure that they are safe and that we keep our accident, accidents to an absolute minimum, and especially with those uh, transmission lines, those high voltage transmission lines. That's really important. So I'm very proud of Johnny Burns and his staff for uh, for working so hard and so diligently to keep themselves safe, which keeps our residents uh, safe as well. So congratulations to the crew. All right, thank you. Okay, so now we'll move into legislation. And Judy, if you could read by title only ordinance 2018-36. Mm -hmm. This is repealing section 452.20, parking of trucks and construction equipment of the codified ordinances of the village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting new section 452.20, parking of trucks, construction equipment, and recreational vehicles. Okay, can I get a motion please? I move. Second. All right. And um, this is the second reading. So I'm going to open the public hearing. And first of all, any, uh, well, I guess Patty. Well, I'll let Judy. 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 Yes. Okay. Sure. So this has gone through Planning Commission. It was brought by Denise Swinger um, in response to some concerns that have been brought by, at times, the police department, at times, the street crew, um, because our code is complaint driven. Um, it's a long process for a zoning administrator to kind of make anything happen through that complaint system. It's a series of letters so that a, a vehicle parked on the street in the way of, for example, a snowplow is not going to get moved in time for, you know, right. like winter. So she thought it might be better to put that in the criminal code. Still complaint driven. Doesn't mean anyone's running around looking for a problem. It means that if there's a, a crew out plowing streets and they need that vehicle moved, that there is the possibility for one running the plate and finding out who the owner is, contacting that <coughs> owner, having that removed in a timely fashion. So Planning Commission was in agreement with that shift to move that into the criminal code for that reason. The street crew is, is also behind that move and the police department supports it as well. And I just would stress again, it is complaint driven. It's not a seek and destroy. And, and I will also point out that it could come in if we have a large fire someplace and there is something blocking, we need to get additional emergency equipment in to fight the fire. This may be something in an emergency that we need to do ASAP. So there, there is always that, not just plowing the street, which is important, but that emergency access as well. Okay. So uh, council, any uh, questions, comments? All right, and uh, citizens, questions or comments? All right, if not, Judy, could you call the roll, please? Yes. Krieger? Yes. McQueen? Yes. Stokes? Yes. Housh? Yes. Okay. All right. Next up, we have Ordinance 2018-35, and Judy, if you could read that in full. Yes, this is repealing Section 1040.12 Utility Roundup Fund and enacting new Section 1040.12 entitled Utility Roundup Program creating a utility roundup program. Whereas the Village of Yellow Springs accepts payments from customers for each of its utilities, and whereas Council for the Village of Yellow Springs through Ordinance 2018-34 established a fund whereby utility customers can choose to overpay their utility bills by rounding their payments up to a whole dollar amount, and such overpayments are then allocated to a designated fund with monies held for the benefit of qualifying utility customers of the Village who are in need and who request financial assistance in paying a delinquent utility bill, 
And whereas new section 1040.12 establishes the program whereby funds may be administered, now therefore counsel for the village of Yellow Springs, Ohio hereby ordains that. Section one, a utility roundup program is hereby enacted to read as set forth in the attached exhibit A. Section two, the village finance director shall establish procedures relating to the administration of the utility roundup program. Section three, this ordinance shall take effect at the earliest time allowed by law. Okay. Can I get a motion, please? I move. Second. All right, great. Um, who's going to tee this one up? Um, Lisa, you want to tee it up and I'll talk about the procedures draft? Um, sure. We've been um, tracking this new utility roundup fund um, for a number of months earlier in this meeting. Patty spoke a little bit um, about when it's starting up. This is a volunteer only opt in program. If you opt in without choosing to donate additional monies, it op uh, rounds up to the nearest dollar. So the maximum you would be rounding up to would be 99 cents. But we do definitely welcome, as your uh, financial capabilities allow, um, uh, supporting uh, the other members of the community that are in need by choosing to give uh, an additional amount. So this has been a series of steps we've had to go through, um, first to create an account, now to establish the program. And so where we are right now is that um, Patty has helped us by putting together a policy and procedure that's in the packet. Um, as some of you may remember who've been tracking this, um, the village doesn't uh, administer this program by ourselves. We're working with a partner, um, the Yellow Springs Senior Center. And uh, you'll hear a little bit more about how that works when Patty talks about the policy and procedure. But basically, the reason why we're working with a partner is to just promote some confidentiality of the process. Yeah. Patty, you want to talk about that? Um, absolutely. So what will happen is um, there is a procedure in the packets for um, applications to be submitted to the utility office. Once the applications come in, um, the staff down there will um, ensure that the information on it is accurate as far as dollar amounts, past due, whether these folks have utilized the program within the last 12 months, because that is one of the stipulations is that it is available once every 12 months. Um, you have to be in threat of disconnection of services for non-payment. Um, you also have to go on a payment plan of up to six months for your remaining past due balance unless prohibited by your landlord. So if you're a renter and your landlord prohibits that through lease or gives us a written documentation that says, no, my tenants cannot go <coughs> on the payment plan, you're still eligible for the initial assistance, just not, you don't have to go on the payment plan. But we have to have that written documentation. Um, you can get it. Uh, up to 12 months, and at this time we've established it as up to $200 until we see what kind of donations we get, what type, how many applications we get. Um, so you will come in, submit your application, the utility office will ensure everything is accurate, they will anonymize your application. So they're going to uh, make a copy and then they're going to take off your name and your address and the only identifier that's going to be on there is your account number. Um, so that, that's how we can track it. We will then send the anonymized applications over to the Yellow Springs Senior Center, who has a committee that will once a month review these applications and, and tell us in what amounts to what accounts we disperse these funds as credits onto the accounts. Um, and the reason we did that is because the village should not be in the business of dispersing those funds um, to pay ourselves. So we needed another nonprofit that was willing to take on that responsibility to vet those applications. They won't know whose application they're looking at because we're anonymizing it, but at the same time, we're not deciding who gets the money. Um, they will send them back to us, <coughs> excuse me, in time for, <coughs> I am also catching a cold, in time for that money to be dispersed to keep um, the folks from disconnection for that month and then we'll start all over. And the reason it gets a little bit tricky is if you look at, um, you'll see that the application has to be received by the village office um, no later than 10 a.m. on the 21st day of each month, we will get those over to the senior center. So we have a shot, we have a cutoff here in, in the office of, I and I may have changed this. There, there were some edits. That's why it says draft. There were some edits after this went into the packet. 
Um, but at, by 10 a.m. on the 21st, we'll get them over to the Senior Center. The Senior Center has three business days to look those over, make their decision, send them back over to us with the credits. That ensures that this will be done in as timely a manner as we can to prevent the shutoffs. Um, and that all has to do with due dates and when the notices go out and all of that. Um, so are there any questions about how the program will run, about anything that's in the policy draft, any of that? Well, I would just add that there's also an informational component, informational slash educational component uh, regarding other uh, resources. Mm -hmm. uh, $200 may not sound like a lot, right. Uh, but as Patty advised and as I mentioned earlier, uh, we need to know how much money we have to work with. So if we, right. um, and it's until the funds are exhausted right. it is a critical point. Right. Uh, so if we don't have enough money to start making donations or if we have so little that we're barely doing anything to assist people, uh, there are other agencies uh, in the region uh, that provide similar assistance and so we would make that information available. Right. Uh, to the residents as well. To That's ensure. a very good point, Kevin. Mm -hmm. and, and that information is on the application, um, which um, we're still fine tuning, but uh, that information, has, application does have a list of other agencies that can assist um, in times of need. We have that list available down at the utilities office. We've had that list forever. So it is available. We do try to help folks find that other assistance. So, very good point. Mm -hmm. um, I have some questions mm -hmm. and um, first I'd like to thank Lisa and Patty and the Senior Center and anyone else who's been working on this because it's been hanging out there for a couple years and I really appreciate the work that's been done and I also appreciate that we can have our own line item for this as opposed to sending the money off somewhere else and then come back I mean it just seems like it makes it simpler mm -hmm. so I have so I guess a question of concern. I'm I'm disappointed that there are landlords in town who would not want, who would not allow their tenants to be on a payment plan. However, we can't do anything about that. It does concern me that a tenant with such a landlord would have to go and get permission from the landlord. I I, I, I that bothers me. I would like for us to take the tenant's word on that, frankly, and not have to go to such a landlord because that just sets up, seems to me that sets up an unnecessary red flag. The, the landlord is gonna know, if they actually are not paying their utilities, the landlord is gonna know anyway. And, uh, and I can address that a little bit, and I understand where your concern's coming from, but we actually have a list down in the utilities office already of landlords who don't permit their tenants so to that, go on so that plans. The, the if tenant wouldn't have the, to. The tenant wouldn't have to if that is if one of their if their landlord is one of the ones on the list. Uh -huh. And in fact, okay. what I've asked um, the the uh, ladies downstairs to do in preparation is to contact those landlords that we are aware of that adhere to that policy and just make sure that we have from them in writing and because we know who rents from who anyway. Yeah. So if one of them, if a tenant comes in that has one of the landlords, we already have that. The tenant doesn't have to worry about it. And okay, uh, another question. Let's say um, the person owes two hundred dollars, mm -hmm. and they get two hundred dollars. Then they wouldn't need to be on a payment plan, would they? I mean, that two hundred dollars would cover their bill. Correct. So that's one element that I think the wording is a little bit unclear. Mm -hmm. um, because I, I think as we discuss the intention that if they need the program, they will be encouraged to go on a payment plan. But it's hard to know if they'll need it the next month. I mean, there are some situations a person might not need it the next month. Mm -hmm. They do need it the next month. Can well, we, I mean, can if we, someone owes $300 and we give them 200 then they're going to have to go on a payment plan to right. pay off that extra amount. That's right. But it, so, okay. So... Um, the last thing is, it seems to me it would be nicer if people could come before they're getting ready to get cut off. Like, we got our bills today. If I got my bill and I'm going, whoa, mm -hmm. this is so much higher because my toilet was leaking, I didn't know it, and I 
know, $500 on, I know I can't pay it, that I could come down today and have it rather than have to wait until it's past due and then I'm going to owe more money. They, they, don't, they don't have to wait. They can come in and put the application in ahead of time. It's just that there's a cutoff. Okay. We, we won't know that they're technically past due until the after the 15th passes and we've processed all the payments that are there when we come in on the 16th. Okay. So they can come in and put that application in if something like that happens or there's a circumstance that's extenuating and they, they know for sure they're going to be on that list because you, know, you have to be two months past due to be on that list. So you, if you know for sure you're going to be two months past due and that gives you a threat of disconnection, then you can definitely come in and put that in. And if, if, if the 17th comes and, and we look at that list and for some reason something wonderful has happened and you're not on that list, then your application would not go to the senior center. I guess just having people have the opportunity to catch this as soon as possible, mm -hmm. rather than having to wait a month when they haven't paid their bill, then another month, or whatever it is. It mm -hmm. seems like it would be best for the people and best for the people. Well, and, t I, it, and I think if I understand what you're asking, Mary Ann, you would like people to be able to do it when they're one month past due, as opposed to two months. Or even before. Just like I said, I might have gotten this bill, and and it was five hundred dollars, mm -hmm. and I have a hundred dollars set aside to pay the bill. Yeah, if, I could come in today and say, "Hey, mm -hmm. I'm not going to be able to pay it," mm -hmm. and and that gets it from the beginning, not having to wait. And, well, I mean, that, yeah. I think not only is it worse for the village, it's very stressful for people knowing that they owe money and they can't pay it. And it seems like it's much better for people to be able to come in right away and say, this is what's going on. Well, and, and, and that is something that I think we should look at maybe in the future once this program gets up and going. Right now the concern is that we start getting the donations in and have enough to help those people who are in threat of disconnection. And if it turns out that there's additional money there and we can expand that in the future, all that needs to do is be a change in the policy. Okay. Um, I suppose that, that's why the policy is written separately from the resolute or the ordinance. Okay because the change in policy can be a, a discussion and an approval at council table as opposed to a piece of legislation. Okay, well, I really support this, and I, I won't belabor it. I just want it to be as work as well for everyone. And uh, with regard to giving thanks, uh, the HRC represented by Tim Baum, who's in the audience, and uh, Eleanor Hendrickson, our um, uh, Miller Fellow uh, mm -hmm. yeah. has had a role in helping to uh, put this uh, policy together. Yeah, Tim, Tim and, and Eleanor are working on the application and the, the informational materials and, and educational materials also, Tim? Yeah, so. Tim's, Tim's nodding, nodding yes. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Tim. <laughs> um, so I had a couple comments slash questions. Mm -hmm. um, so the first uh, is, let me start with the simple one. So I, I want to again emphasize that a municipality having a utility roundup program is extremely rare mm -hmm. in Ohio. We've only found two communities that have done this. Mm -hmm. Normally it's privates like the DPNLs and AEPs. So we are, you know, making a lot of effort to try to extend this kind of service. Uh, so, so it is unique. Um, second thing is I do want to keep emphasizing um, that as we develop this program, you know, per some of Mary Ann's thoughts, you know, we're going to learn by doing. Um, I don't want to forget about uh, bringing in energy conservation practices right. um, and ultimately really solving these problems beyond just, you know, paying a bill in the short term. Um, and I think there's a lot of potential for that. Right, and that was a topic of discussion at the Energy Board. Mm -hmm. And the Energy Board is also working on a packet of materials, educational materials, and informational materials, as well as other possible things that the village can do to help Great. folks lower their bills. Great. So. And then my third comment was, when I read the process, um, the way I understand it is you apply it's vetted by the senior center and then you're approved. So I guess the concern or question I have is related to when we do have funding gaps. Mm -hmm. Because it seems like the process is you get approved, 
and then we hope the money is there. Mm -hmm. um, so I wonder if there's a, a mechanism or a way that we can put a call out if we have a very large ask at some point, um, because I imagine there might be citizens that would want to uh, you know, rise to the occasion. Um, I'm sure that we could do a, a Facebook post and a, uh, a news really a press release on the website. I'm sure Megan would be put that up online for us. She's very helpful and, and we love her for, for always. I send her things at the last minute and she's like, yeah, I'll get it up. So um, we could certainly do that if it's an especially um, especially large need or you know it's it's February and we're having those below, below, below zero temps that we're expecting again this year, so everybody please be prepared for all that snow they're predicting. Um, then perhaps we do a hyper-reach blast okay. or something like that. So we do have ways to get that out if we have to. Okay. I, I have a question and, you know, this is not something we've discussed at all before, but it was prompted by Brian's question mm -hmm. because, as you know, I'm concerned about the financial startup. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I, I think we should consider if there is a way, if someone's applied and w there's short funding, if there's something we can do to defer shutoff. Um, no, and the reason I say that is because um, the policies and procedures are very clear and have to be applied equally to everyone. Mm -hmm. That said, if we can't help them, we can generally find another organization to help them um, if, you know, they are so inclined. Thank you for that. I, I'd like to continue to explore that and codify it. I, the very first meeting that I brought this idea or I guess it was an old idea, but I was kind of pledging myself to it. Mm -hmm. I set some guiding principles that were idealistic, but I think important. And one of those was that no community member in Yellow Springs should have their power shut off in the winter when it's cold, period. So I think this program is a step in the right direction, mm -hmm. but I'd like to continue thinking about how to really fulfill that mm -hmm. guiding principle. And I know that, that you and, and Colleen are always really supportive, so I feel confident we can do that. Mm -hmm. um, and I just want to add Nathan Lee and Casey to that as well, the, the two utility clerks, because they're very good and, uh, and have a lot of knowledge about where that, that assistance can be found. So. so in the spirit of full funding, I do have a request of counsel, um, but we to slide in here, um, I, I would like the Village of Yellow Springs to write a uh, $2,500 matching grant request to the Yellow Springs Community Foundation, requesting $2,500 from the Community Foundation if we can match it with $2,500 from citizen donations. That's a great idea. So, um, well, Let's go ahead and decide on that. I mean, I think in general, uh, usually that's by consensus. I think that's a yeah. great idea. I don't see any opposition from council for that grant. That the village would put in 25. No, this no. is matching. The community, community foundation would match citizen contributions. Oh, up to twenty five. Up to twenty five hundred dollars. Okay. Yeah, I think that's because if we had five thousand yeah. dollars, we can do this program with five thousand okay. dollars. Okay. And who will write that? Grant? I will. Okay. Excellent. I mean, Thank I think you. that sounds great. Um, any other questions or comments from council about the program? Um, Tim, come on up. Yeah, please come up to the mic. You'll proofread, right? If you did fall behind and you wanted assistance before this program, there's currently, happens now, you can fill out a request for payment. Request for payment agreement, you can do that right now. So, yeah. We do offer payment plans of up to six months um, mm -hmm. down in the utility office. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. 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 okay, great. Any other questions or comments from citizens? Yes, uh, please come to the mic. I, I think I might have missed when we talked about 
talked about the first ordinance. I came here to speak about the RVs and the mobile homes. But when I heard it read off, I didn't hear that. It just said um, service vehicles. So did I miss it? It, it yeah. is in the title, but I was reading quickly. It does, it, the last part of the title says and recreational vehicles, but it would be easy to miss. So how, because I'd like to speak to it, but I don't want to interrupt things, but I. Um, yeah, so well, let's, uh, okay, let's, we'll, we'll vote on this legislation and then we'll okay. give you an opportunity to speak about that. Okay. So, okay, thanks. Um, any other questions or comments? On what subject? Uh, on the subject we're talking about, which is the utility roundup program. Um, okay, uh, and so I think we will go ahead and take a vote, even though this is the first reading. Uh, Judy, if you could do the roll call, please. Yes. Stokes? Yes. Krieger? Yes. McQueen? Yes. Housh? Yes. Okay, um, so I will, uh, I mean, back us up to, uh, have you share your comments about the uh, RV legislation? Um, which, and as a side note, uh, that was a second reading and we voted on it, but yeah. When did, so did you? Um, <laughs> I have two, but anyway, I'm, but. I'm uh, an educated person and I missed all that. So how did I do that? Yes. Because I didn't hear anything about mobile homes. So was it not read? Did you have the. It, it, it's, it it's, it's recreational vehicles, not mobile homes. So I just want to make sure that everyone's on well, the uh, RV. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so if you vote, I guess I want it before I say something, what does it mean that you voted on it? So what did you vote? Um, we voted to pass the ordinance. And if I understood it, then you, you voted to say that if someone says, hey, there's people living in a recreational vehicle at the end of my street and I call with a grievance, then it would go be inspected, but it's not something you're going to seek out. Mm -hmm. Right. Is that right? That's correct. Right. Okay, then I'll read my letter because, because I have a problem with that. So um, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, I call myself a 70-30 Springer. 70% of me loves the town, the Glen, the bike trail, the art and access to the things I need. Then there's a 30% of part of me that just scratches my head on certain decisions. And one of those would be that I routinely walk or ride my bike toward the Glen and the Wellness Center, and there are often trucks, broken downs, RVs, and even tents on my street. In addition, if there is, I'm sorry, my writing's a bit small here. If there is um, RVs, there's also parked cars and more parked cars that come toward the RVs. People standing out in the street, talking, yelling, and walking into town. All of that would be fine if this was a campground if there were bathrooms and showers and a place for proper sanitation, but this is at the end of my street. We pay a hefty sum to have access to the Glen and have easy access to the village. 30% of me is angry every time I write my city to uh, Yellow Springs check, why not just move into my, with my Airstream down the street? When I've asked the people on the street why they're there, they respond that they know somebody here or even we don't have the money for a campground. When I called the police to inquire, I got so many different answers, I called the zoning office. When I called the zoning office, I was referred back to the police. None of the reasons made any sense, zero answers from anyone. Finally, after trying to contact, or finally after tiring of the constant campers less than one minute from my home, I called zoning and asked if I could just camp there for a day right behind the lucky camper that's there almost every week. I was told, no, we have an ordinance against that. The ordinance is not enforced, or it is enforced, on some folks and not on others. I'm a camper. We have a camper that is maintained on our property. No one lives in it. When we use it, we travel when we pay for a park or a campground. When my friends visit, I do not park it at the end of the street and hope they will manage all the sanitary and environmental issues in an appropriate way. Campsites and campgrounds are monitored by people and rules and codes, and they apply. We only know, or we don't know, are the campers that are living at the end of my street, are they taking care of their camper in a sanitary way? That bothers me. That, that's unhealthy. I don't think that that's clean. I think that's dirty. I, was, I would totally support a Yellow Springs campground, one that's affordable, secure, and sanitary. Then um, there are more than 15 serious diseases that you get, can get from dirty campsites. I walk it almost every day and there's almost always someone living there in some inappropriate manner. I'm a single female hiking into the Glen. Every time there's a camper or truck parked at the, on my way toward the Glen, I wonder, am I safe? I would 
I would feel much safer knowing that there's a camper in my town that has registered, has paperwork, has a license, and made themselves knowable to a community. Someone, if someone should, um, sorry, my writing's smaller than it should be here. Should someone from this unmonitored and unsafe pop-up campground threaten or hurt a taxpaying citizen, I think the council would be hard pressed to justify this odd ordinance. Please remember that this is a community of hiking and biking people. Non-identified, unpaying visitors are not an asset. In fact, they can be a liability. My biggest concern is when I call to complain, I get different answers every time. And I think it's unsanitary and unhealthy to have people camping on a public street a minute from my house. And can you state your name for the record? Laurie Stover. OK, thank you. Um, so I will just say that um, the goal of this ordinance is to move towards addressing these issues uh, in a more active way and to answer those questions. Um, but I do think if, uh, if, if we need to continue to look at this issue um, and, and, and tweak it, we're, we're certainly open to that. Um, but anyway, the goal is to address those concerns and give you an opportunity to now call and there not be that confusion. So what is the rule? Do you want to read that yeah. out, Patty? Because it's yeah. it, the, the, the part that has, has changed, for lack of a better word, to put this under the police department now, reads, no person shall park any mobile home or recreational vehicle, including but not limited to motor homes, camper trailers, travel trailers, pop-up campers, boats, snowmobiles, motorized dirt vehicles, dune buggies, and similar vehicles, and the trailers used to transport them on any street, alley, highway, or up other public place in the village except for expeditious loading and unloading of the vehicle. So that, what we've done with this legislation is put that clearly into the purview of the police department now. When did that happen? Tonight. Tonight. Right 30 now. days from tonight's read, that becomes effective. So if I call the police officer, they'll be able to say, it's my job. I will go down there and ask that person to move. 30 days from today, okay, perfect. that will be in the police department's purview. Okay. Okay. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you, Lori. Okay. I had actually wanted to speak to that issue, too. But come, you can okay. Come. <clears throat> So I'm Lori's partner, Hi. and I live at uh, Your name is? Kathy Van Horn. I live on West North College Street. We've been here for about two, two and a half years and have loved a lot about Yellow Springs. You know, we use the frequent hikers in the Glen, we swim at the Gaunt Pool, we exercise at the Wellness Center, and we love the abundance of music and art. We love walking and biking into town, talking with friendly, friendly villagers, dining, seeing a movie, and shopping at Tom's Market. Yellow Springs, however, comes with a really high price tag, and we question long-term affordability. As we make out checks for property and school taxes, we also watch, to our be bewilderment, people parking their RVs on city streets and taking up residency for extended periods of time. Why are property owners incurring high taxes while others are allowed to stay for free? We all need to contribute. As a camper myself, I support residents who may want to host their loved ones for a period of time in an RV on their property, or perhaps a village would consider developing a small campground complete with showers and commodes. Both of, both of these options op, um, would provide more appropriate sanitation than those available to campers staying on the street. A campground would also bring in little revenue, a little revenue. My partner and I are considering selling our property and going full-time in our RV. We are lured by adventure and fewer costs. At the same time, we would never expect or feel entitled to free stays on city streets or public property. Thank you. Okay. And again, I'll just say that that is exactly why this legislation was passed tonight to address right. that. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Athena? Yeah. Oh, just sure. Sorry, I didn't know you guys had passed it, and I, I meant to come much earlier tonight. Um, this legislation Give kind your of name, ran please. A, I'm sorry? Your name, please. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Athena Fannin. Um, I, had, I, I kind of brushed up against this legislation, and I'm going to be honest. I really didn't understand it very well, but as a person who's displaced, it kind of gave me a sense of fear. Um, I have a large conversion van, and it has a bed that lays down. 
and as someone who has to occasionally sleep in my vehicle, and as someone who has had a really bad experience with police, it actually kind of terrifies me to know that this came under the police department. And I thought to myself, am I going to be trying to be a human being doing a basic function, and I'm going to have a police officer banging on my vehicle, rousting me and have another issue? That's my personal issue. On a systematic level, I'm, I'm really, really concerned about ordinances that criminalize both poverty and homelessness. And Dayton and Cincinnati have been in the news for these kinds of ordinances. And clearly I'm too late to say anything or communicate anything about this one, but I really, really want you guys to consider at a much deeper level the way your policies affect people who are struggling and vulnerable. And a lot of us don't want to be on the streets. We don't want to be in what some may consider dirty or unsanitary conditions. We are human beings. And we have to have places to go to the bathroom. We have to have places to sleep, and we have to have places to bathe. And that will happen somehow, anyhow. That's the way it is in Cincy, Dayton, or Yellow Springs. So I'm actually kind of worried now. This goes over to the police department. I just, I, I'm going to start repeating myself. Please, please just try to dig really deep on these policies and maybe even this one. Okay. Thank you, Athena. Um, okay. Uh, and again, I apologize that uh, folks missed that legislation being read. Um, all right, so we're going to move into uh, the next ordinance, which is 2018-38. And um, Judy, I guess we'll do this by title only, but I do want to make sure we read the new purpose statement. Certainly. This is repealing old section 288.01 of chapter 288.01 of the Public Art Commission establishment <clears throat> and purpose of Title VIII Boards and Commissions of Part II Administration Code of the Codified Ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting new chapter 288.01 Arts and Culture Commission establishment and purpose. Okay. And um, I don't, Lisa, do you want to read the new purpose statement? Do you want to go ahead and take a motion yeah. on that? Um, so can I get a motion, please? Move. Second. All right. Would you like to read that? Mm -hmm. There is hereby established in and for the village a commission, which shall be known as the Arts and Culture Commission. The Arts and Culture Commission supports the mission of the council for the village of Yellow Springs by facilitating, promoting, and recognizing that public arts add value by providing educational opportunities, activism, economic sustainability and an improved quality of life. The Commission shall serve to navigate and connect the village creative community and the arts community with the village government. Okay, great. Um, any questions or comments about the new purpose statement? What is the difference between this and the old Yeah, statement? Yeah, it, it's a, a little bit more specific specific about the scope of the commission. And this, the commission originally came about, I believe the first thing was the public uh, music, right, contract? Was that the Actually, first Actually, it started with the uh, bronze oh, the skate sculpture. Park. Oh, the skate park uh, even. And then the skate park, Right, yeah. so the, the commission has been evolving over time. And uh, we just, the commission just hadn't really gotten to updating its statement to better fit the actual work that it's been doing. So that's what this is about. And when you use the word navigate, mm -hmm. can you say what that means? Sure. Um, I really thank the commission for the time that was put into words, wordsmithing this. And, and navigate um, is an important word because there's a lot of, of artists and people who are involved in the arts or adjacent supporting the arts in Yellow Springs. And it's not always easy to figure out who to connect to, figure out where there's resources, connect to the Arts Council, understand what the commission does. And so what we found is our commission is a good central location to do some direction, sometimes to the Arts Council, sometimes to the Community Foundation, sometimes to the college. So we end up being kind of routing, as well yeah, as the actual cool. work that we do. Thank you. Yeah, not that routing isn't work, but <laughs> you know. 
Well, and I, I think it's great work that was done on this. I also appreciate that we're reflecting the cultural piece, you know, as well as the arts. So um, any other questions or comments? So why don't we go ahead and take a vote? We'll be doing a second reading at our next meeting. Um, but Judy, if you could call the roll, please. Yes, Stokes. Yes. Krieger. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Housh. Yes. All right, and finally we have resolution 2018-38. And Judy, could you read that in full, please? All right, this is adopting a policy for charging misdemeanor cases in the mayor's court. Whereas it is the policy of council to process as many misdemeanor cases as possible in the Yellow Springs Mayor's Court, which has been established under the village charter and supported financially by the taxpayers of this community specifically for this purpose. And whereas the Justice System Task Force recommends that action be taken to change the current pattern of police charging mayor's court eligible cases to the Xenia Municipal Court. And whereas council favors implementing cr criminal justice locally and consistently with the guidelines for village policing, and whereas council believes that we can best achieve, achieve this if justice is administered locally to the greatest extent possible, now therefore be it resolved that. Section 1, the village manager is directed to work with the chief of police to ensure that all misdemeanor violations occurring in the village are charged into mayor's court using Yellow Springs ordinances. When possible, nonviolent offenders will be cited into mayor's court. Section two, exceptions to the policy include but are not limited to, one, compact law suspensions, two, OBIs, three, misdemeanor and traffic citations where the offender is not a resident of Greene County, officer discretion due to possible need for a warrant for failure to appear, four, domestic violence, violations of protection orders, misdemeanors if the victim is a family or household member as defined in the Ohio Revised Code section 2919.25, and five cases in which a person will be incarcerated. Section three, the chief of police will present a report to council on at least a quarterly basis, the number and types of cases by name and code section that are being charged into Yellow Springs Mayor's Court and how many to other jurisdictions. Section four, this policy will be fully implemented by November 1st, 2018. Okay, thank you, Judy. Can I get a motion, please? I move. Second. All right, Lisa. Um, yes, I, I also, you'll find a, a memo related to this resolution in the packet. Um, I, I stepped into this work um, as the alternate for the justice system task force and would really like to thank the full justice system task force as well as the mayor's court subcommittee members, um, Patty, Chief Carlson, um, Mayor Canine, and Sergeant Knapp for working on this in a very collaborative way. From the um, it wasn't really a first reading, but there was a version of this resolution that was brought before council, and then after that it was edited. So um, I just want to clarify really what has been edited and what's before you tonight. Uh, primarily, it's been edited to read more clearly. But there is one element that I want to point out. Um, not with any recommendation to not move forward with this resolution, but just because I think it's important that as a council, we all have a common understanding, um, sort of to Ms. Fannin's point, when we're making these kinds of resolutions that we all know the same thing about what some of these terms mean. And I know that for me, um, it, it took some educational time understanding why one of the exceptions is an exception at this point. And that's specifically section two, um, cases in which a person will be incarcerated. Now what, what I didn't know, but that maybe you all know, um, is that if a person is incarcerated and they're brought in under Yellow Springs ordinance, the cost of the incarceration falls on Yellow Springs. On the other hand, if they're taken to jail using the Ohio Revised Code, thus putting the case into Xenia Municipal Court, the costs related to that incarceration do not go into Yellow Springs. So as you both know, I have this justice hat that I put on and then I also have this finance hat. And so looking at strictly at finance, I understand that we're avoiding what could be some very significant costs, that's what we don't know, by um, citing people taken to jail using the Ohio Revised Code. But I want everyone on the council to understand that the way the um, 
policy is currently written, this is 100% police discretion about how they handle these nonviolent misdemeanors. And if they want to take a person to jail for a nonviolent misdemeanor, there is a possibility that that will, you know, just go to Xenia and we as a council or we as a community will lose visibility of why our police officers chose to send a person to jail for a nonviolent misdemeanor and what would come out of that. We lose our sight line the minute that they go into Xenia Municipal Court or we increase the chance that we've lost the sight line. So we don't know at this point how often nonviolent people who commit a misdemeanor are actually taken to jail. We don't know how long the average stay is. We don't know if it happens once a week or a few times a year. So we don't really know the cost of administering local justice. In this case, it might be low, but it's unknown at, that at this time. So my recommendation is that council do pass the resolution, but then direct the committee or some group to continue to work on this issue and quantify what kind of cost exposure that we're facing as a community and then weigh that against our understanding of the exercise of police discretion in our community. I want to point out a really underlying thing and that what I'm saying here it should not be viewed as a lack in confidence of our current chief of police or his team. I am today even more confident in the actions of our chief. But people change. You can't have policies based on who's in a job at a particular time. It's important for us as a community to set policies so if leadership changes or police personnel change, we have the kind of community policing that we're trying to define and then maintain. So I, I really, again, want um, to urge council to pass this resolution, but to not let this topic drop. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I have a couple comments. Uh, one of them is I would recommend that um, we have the reporting be monthly since we're doing that anyway. And the second thing, and it sort of addresses what you just said, um, I'm willing to take, take the leap of faith to move this forward, but I agree that we really need to evaluate what's the risk here. I, I'm skeptical about whether uh, there, there's uh, a high risk of, of jail time with these, but, but I don't have any expertise. So I'm just, you know, I, you know, I think it's important what Lisa pointed out. But we had brought up the idea, someone had, maybe it was even Kate, that um, we could have an explanation as to why something was being um, mm -hmm. referred mm -hmm. to uh, Xenia Municipal. Mm -hmm. And that would be the other thing I would suggest that we include in this policy. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, again, this is nonviolent misdemeanors. Right. We're not talking about other sure. types of arrests. So just so I understand the changes you're requesting. Right. right. So one so one of them would be monthly reporting, because I think we do that already. Right. Um, and then secondly, that we if something is not cited to mayor's court, there's a brief explanation as to, to why, why to help with tracking. Okay. It, and I did want to point out that you have at your places, mm -hmm. um, and there are some of these on the table also in the hall, the statistics for May, June, July, and August um, for the total number of charges per month and uh, how many were eligible to go to mayor's court under this uh, policy um, and how many actually went to mayor's court. And um, so you can see that in May, 6% uh, of the charges that were eligible to be sent to mayor's court did not. 6% were sent to Xenia that could have gone to mayor's court. In June it was 1%, in July it was 3%, and in August it was 2%. So we're getting there, but I understand fully the need to put that in writing because the chief may not always be the chief. And I may not always be the manager, and you may not always be on council. <laughs> So um, the good news is this is a resolution, and so if council chooses to change this in some way, um, it, other than the edits, in the future when we do the research on the incarceration costs, 
that's easily done. Okay. Do you guys want to change section three to say report a, present a report to council on a monthly basis, number and types, et cetera, and how many to other jurisdictions and why that decision was made? If you want to vote on that change, I, we can do it now. Um, yeah, I'd like to make a motion to uh, amend the resolution uh, based on what you just articulated. I'll second that. Okay. Mm -hmm. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Yes. Aye. 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 Um, okay. So then other discussion yeah, about I, the, I, yes. Uh, Patty, why, what are the kind of situations in which someone would be incarcerated for a minor misdemeanor? Uh, it could be a, a disorderly conduct. Um, uh, <coughs> intoxicated disorderly conduct where they've fought an officer. Chris, what else can you think of off the top of your head? Well, typically a minor misdemeanor, a person is not subject to arrest at all. Uh, the way the disorderly conduct statute is written under Ohio law, there's two categories. There's a disorderly conduct fourth degree misdemeanor, which is a jailable uh, offense, zero to 30 days is a possible penalty, and then the minor misdemeanor. Right. While, while, I, while I doubt that this happens on a, on a recurring basis at all, but what you typically see is disorderly conducts that relate to the drunken disorderly individual. That's intoxicated or a, a, an impaired individual. Right. And then the officer has the discretion of whether or not the charge is a minor misdemeanor or a, a fourth degree misdemeanor. Mm -hmm. If it's a minor misdemeanor and the officer makes a determination that that individual is a, a risk to himself or to others, mm -hmm or herself, the officer then in the exercise of discretion can take that individual into custody. Um, this just says misdemeanor, it doesn't say minor misdemeanor. Agreed, so. agreed, but Marianne used the word minor oh, misdemeanor, okay. so I wanted to make that distinction. So typically, the only misdemeanor offenses, because in our, under our law, we have first, second, third, and fourth degree misdemeanors that are all carry potential jail time. Minor, misde minor misdemeanors carry no jail time potential, just a possible fine of zero to $150. Okay. And I'd like I can just to amplify a little bit, the circumstances under which someone might be uh, uh, arrested for a misdemeanor, any number of factors. It could be maybe they already have warrants for their arrest. We've talked about that. Um, but I, again, I, I think that they're few and far between. So that, and that, thank you, Chris, and it may be, but I think it would be good to know. I, I agree. I mean, when, when you look at the statistical data, what it says is total charges, but it also doesn't break out what charges were not eligible under this policy as it's implemented. So there's certainly more data that can yeah. be right, extrapolated. Right, which, yeah, which is what Brian right. wanted to know. Okay, thanks, Chris. Yeah. Um, uh, Kevin? Yeah, if I could. Um, and I think just as, as Chris was uh, reiterating, if the report that the chief is presenting does ferret out, you know, all those nitnoid data points, um, I, I, I guess I, I, I would like for that report to answer the questions, that, and I think it might be clear with respect to the financial uh, exposure in terms of um, the, the times and, or the number of times that we are going to be responsible for incarceration. Uh, so again, I think it's clear if the, if the information is collected and reported, uh, then it wouldn't have to be someone else, I think, uh, gathering that information. It would be clear uh, based, on a, both based on a column of data, however many times that event occurs, it occurred. And then depending on how long that person is incarcerated, then we, you know, you follow up over time and say it ended up costing the village, you know, X amount of dollars. <clears throat> and then the other thing that I want to mention is we, we use the phrase community policing so often. Um, and I think the six of us up here might come up with varying definitions of what that actually is. I think uh, members of the uh, citizens uh, of the village might have different definitions. So I think there ought to be some real uh, work done on defining what that is, creating uh, expectations of the citizens, of uh, the police department, of, of everyone involved uh, to know exactly what that is. Because 
Um, I think we, uh, someone, some individuals might have been uh, criticized for doing it or not doing it, but I don't think it is clear uh, in, 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 in everyone's mind. Mm -hmm. Lisa? So, Kevin, I, I don't disagree with you, and I think that's an important body of work. But I think it's important for that not to stop us from moving forward with policy. What comes to mind is a, a quote from a famous jazz musician who went by the short name of Satchmo. And he was asked about what is jazz, and he said, I, you know, you'll, there's this, this and other kind of music, but you'll know it when you see it. You'll know it when you hear it. And I think what, what my experience of the community right now is, we may not have perfectly defined community policing, but when we know it when we don't see it. We know <laughs> there, are, there are outliers that are very clear. And so I, I think that you know, we should move forward with these kinds of policies. Oh, let me be clear. I'm not suggesting that we spend time defining community policing with respect to this resolution. OK. It was a separate, separate issue. So I will leave your comments for debate another time. Well, and I do just want to add that, you know, um, I've steered away from community policing uh, because of the negative connotation for some community members. Um, but I would urge us to not forget our guidelines for village policing, which do begin to articulate some concrete examples. And those could certainly be, you know, developed ad infinitum, but you know, there, there is work that's been done that, that's more concrete than just you know, you know, kind of general brush strokes. Um, okay. Thank you. Uh, questions or comments from, yes, Kate Hamilton. I just thought this, Kate Hamilton, I just thought this would be a good time to plug um, having a justice system commission that you will be considering next time because this is the kind of stuff that they've worked on and looking into um, how much things would cost and such would be right up some of our members' alleys. And we have a huge data set, if you want to look at that. John Hempfling has a huge data set that you can play with. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to put that plug in. I think it's really important to keep going with it and to work on these type of things that seem like nitty gritty, but they're super important and time consuming and we do have people with a passion for that in our community. So All right. that's my plug. Thanks, oh, and Kate. we did work a lot on that yep. policing policy. So did the 360 project as well. Mm -hmm. so three, yeah. Yes. Thank Thanks. you, Kate. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Um, Ken? Uh, thank you. Um, I hope you'll humor me. Obviously, it's abundantly clear that it's, this is an issue that's important to me. Um, there was an incident uh, this week. Uh, of what, uh, hearsay evidence, okay, uh, but uh, on reliable authority, uh, there was an, a case uh, uh, in which a uh, local resident uh, ran a stop sign and there was a traffic uh, citation issued. And um, aged uh, person, and uh, in the course of the uh, interaction between the police and this person, the service revolver was unholstered. Uh, do any of you know, and humor me, and you don't need to tell me what your answer is, but I'm just curious if, if any of you heard about this on any channel at all? Anybody? Uh, we've heard about it, but uh, is, is this related to the mayor's court resolution? It was relating because I because I, I guess I want to finish this discussion. Oh, that's fine. And that's then fine. If it's not appropriate to this, right, this topic right now. Okay. But you could bring it up at Citizen, at Citizen Concerns. Concerns. Okay. Um, any other questions or comments about the mayor's court resolution policy? Yes, Megan. Uh, Megan from Yellow Springs News. I'm just still confused about this section, the new section, uh, to the cases in which a person will be incarcerated. So. As I understand it, there is a discretion involved in that you were, which you were kind of discussing whether the incarceration happens or not. I'm just very confused about the language of that that it's using. Like, uh, case, so are, you, are you saying that 
because then it seems to kind of throw many of the possible ones that could come to the village mm -hmm. back on the officer's discretion, which I know you're kind of trying That's to. That, I, so I mean, I'm you're, you're seeing exactly the point. So um, at, at this point, um, the police do have full discretion to um, cite someone into Xenia Municipal Court even for a nonviolent misdemeanor, which technically could come before the mayor's court. So you're right, there's another layer of discretion of if someone is um, nonviolent, having a misdemeanor, whether or not the police believe that merits incarceration or not. And my recommendation that we continue to track how often that's happening is partly to get underneath that and understand how discretion is being used around incarceration for nonviolent misdemeanors, one way or the other. Yeah. It is a consideration, and that was the primary reason why, at this point, um, thinking that the volume is low, um, the resolution directs, uh, allows discretion to charge them into Xenia. There, Lisa, um, I need this clarified. How I read this is it says, if a case is eligible for mayor's court with exceptions, what, one, two, three, four, five, five. one, put it set okay. aside, it will go to mayor's court. The last exception is if that person is going to be put in jail. Yes. But that's not just what you said. You said that they have the discretion to cite them to Xenia Municipal Court. Those are two different things. Can, can, okay. So the, this, was, this was quite an involved discussion that we had at, at the, at the uh, committee meeting. And it was, we wanted to make sure everybody was on the same page. Everyone at the meeting acknowledged that there will be instances in which an individual needs to be incarcerated. Right. If that individual is a danger to him or herself, themselves, or others, then it becomes, we, we have to, we being the village government, have to ensure that they do not harm themselves or someone else. So while technically a person who has, is being cited for uh, disorderly conduct while intoxicated could technically be cited to mayor's court, if they are a danger to themselves or others, that means that they must be monitored until such time as they are not a danger to themselves or others. And the question then becomes, do we do that? Do the, does the jail do that because they are better equipped to do that we had this entire discussion and we had difficulty coming up with a way to term it and this is what we came up with yeah and i i get that mm -hmm. but that is different than just saying an officer has full discretion to cite cases to xenia municipal court if a person is going to be incarcerated it, okay that's yeah. 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 I, I, I'm sorry. I was. I was only speaking within the context of Part V. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. right. If the person's being incarcerated. Thank you. Mm -hmm. did, did that. Did that help, Megan? Okay. Any other questions or comments? All right. So I think we're ready for a vote. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Sounds like no opposed. Okay. Um, all right, so now we are at citizen concerns, which is the point on the agenda. And can you pass me that list, please? Uh, when we will hear comments on anything that is not on the agenda. And um, I know a few people signed up, although may no longer have comments. Um, okay, so Lee Paul, um, is Tanya still here? Yes. Okay. And, uh, and just to mention that we ask that you limit your comments to three minutes. Judy will keep time and uh, please proceed. Thank and you. you can start by saying your name. Yes, my name is Tanya Rush Jilson and I will be brief. I, um, I'm not here to, you know, torch and pitchfork anything. I was disappointed hearing about the incident um, that my other citizen, fellow citizen referenced briefly. 
um, regarding officer pulling a service revolver. I was also actually disappointed to hear that he resigned. I think we're losing an opportunity. I think we're losing an opportunity to teach, to grow, um, to learn, him as well as us. Um, but I think we should take a look. I know social media is a mixed bag of things, but there were hints about this being an affirmative action hire, which I, raises my hackles because I don't think that was the case. I, I don't think the village would simply look at an affirmative action um, situation. But perhaps there should be more transparency with the, um, with the hiring process. Obviously, something needs to be looked at. I unfortunately don't have suggestions at the moment for what would need to change. Um, I just want to voice my concern and uh, my support in um, making changes so we make our community better for everyone. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Tanya. Um, is Kathy still here? Oh, Kathy Van Horn already left. And Lori also spoke. Um, okay, so do we have any other uh, citizen concerns? Athena Fanny? Again, I apologize. I didn't know that Officer Neal had resigned um, late. I'm sorry. Um, but one of the concerns I did bring up in an online discussion that I, I want to, I think we need to keep talking about is that um, we've had at least three shootings, police related. Um, I can't remember what I wrote. Three shootings, we've had physical abuse, we've had intimidation in the past five years. Um, we only have three officers, I, I could be wrong, somebody would correct me, I'm sure, um, that have been here long term. Um, I guess I'm not counting Nipper. Um, we have David Meister, who was recently demoted. We have uh, Officer Penrod uh, Watson, and we have Nipper. And Knapp has been here since 2013. So in the long term of this history that we've got going on of losing a lot of officers, having a lot of complaints, the New Year's incident, there's just three people left. Um, so I think that while there are abstract structural things, we we can look at, we need to start getting pretty specific. We have hiring issues. This isn't just about training in OPADA in the national stage. That, that's huge, don't get me wrong. But we have, and I'm gonna say it because the last time it was said, somebody was told to be quiet. We have two really bad supervisors and they hurt people. And there's a long line of us. And their job was to supervise Officer Neal. That was their job, to supervise the supervisor. When an officer, you guys did an intense, in-depth investigation of Officer Meister, and yet these other officers, it's not until there's pitchforks out. So Officer Hawley, there were signs that there were issues. There was a video that watch, was watched a ton of times by a supervisor. And then he was let loose on New Year's rather than supervision happening. So this is a piece you guys are gonna have to face because if you don't face it, this stuff is gonna keep, like, still keep happening. So I guess that's, that's my comment. Okay, thanks Athena. Any other citizen concerns? Okay, Robert. Robert Paschel, I only heard about the incident uh, referred to today. I've known Jim Agna for 52 years, not super well. It just seems to me that if you train a gun on somebody, it's an absolute last ditch measure. Your life would have to be severely and immediately endangered. And I just cannot imagine Jim Agna endangering somebody's life, quite to the contrary. I see Jim Agna as somebody who needs an enormous amount of help. And it's just distressing to me to hear about this. I'll also tell you that I wasn't there, I've only heard about it secondhand, and I wasn't in the mind of the officer. So, but it is very upsetting to me to hear about this. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Robert. 
Any other citizen concerns? Um, yeah. Yes, please. I'm Donna Silbert, and I'm concerned about this issue as well. But I'm also concerned that here we are talking about, you know, a 92-year-old white male that we all know, so we know he's harmless. There has to be something more about policy that keeps every innocent person safe. And th it's lacking. For this to have happened this past weekend, after all the process that we've gone through, is very frightening. So I think it, policy has to be addressed. It has to be addressed clearly. Mm -hmm. And we can't just say this incident is now over because he resigned. And I'd also like to know, did he resign cleanly or is it like our school resignation with a pay out for a full year? What are the terms of this resignation? <coughs> and does he get um, a reference for his next job? Do I think we can answer that. Okay. There, is, there is no package. Um, Officer Neal resigned of his own accord. There's no severance or agreement or there's simply a resignation. So that's the, that's the answer to your second question first. The answer to your first concern is that we as a staff have internally already begun talking about how we can improve our processes. Um, to alleviate this, this problem. Done you, after New Year's Eve? Or yes. Since this issue? We are continuing them. Okay. Okay. And how, how we can... About the slow process. Right, and, and I think that's a fair statement. So I, I'll, I'll just say a few things and, and wrap this up. First of all, when council and the village team hears any reports of this nature, we are all distressed. Believe me, um, Lisa was texting me all weekend. We're all very concerned whenever we hear these things. And, and that's not a, you know, I, I am not making any judgment about the full details. As Robert said, I also was not there. That being said, I, I guess I think it's important that we remember that what we are trying to do is unchartered territory. We are trying to undo a system where officers are trained in a way that we don't want in this village. And so I understand that it, it may seem slow, but we are working at this nonstop. And I mean, Kate Hamilton can tell you, since I've been on council, since all the members here have been on council, we are very vigilant about this and we're doing, uh, I, I feel, everything we can to stem this tide. But keep in mind that, I mean, we are up against a, a system that does not develop the kind of village policing that we are committed to. Um, but that being said, it's not just, you know, an officer resigned and so it's gone. That's why these comments are important for us to hear and we need to keep on thinking about it. And uh, our village manager, our chief, our council is very committed to this work and that's not going to stop. Um, I'd like to say something yes. too. Um, sometime during this process, a uh, year or so ago, I, it was Pan Wright, right. Right. that's how he says his mm -hmm. name, Sub submitted a concept and I think it came from an article or NPR program he had heard that uh, there, on the one hand, we can look at our police department as warriors or we can look at them as guardians. I think clearly we want our officers to be guardians, mm -hmm. to keep people safe, whether it's from themselves or from each other, we, that, that is what we want. However, it appears, and maybe it's increasing, that the training that officers get is warrior. And I recently was talking about with one of my, well, today, with one of my friends, Pat Deweese, who has been in the Justice Task Force, and she said, it's not so much the personality of an individual officer, it is this training that they're getting. It's like we, if we're gonna be getting officers coming in from this training, we have to like reprogram, reprogram them, deprogram them, whatever. And it, it's not about policy here, I don't think. 
we've been working for years now on policy. Well, it's about the practice. Policy, the higher schools aren't trained this way. They have to be campers. There's Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Donna, if you're going to talk, we need you to come up to the mic if you're going to speak. Well, I mean, I, I think we understand Donna's point. Um, yeah, we believe me, the search is out for non-traditional officers, and, and, and that is something that we're, you know, continuing to do. Um, but, uh, you know, I think this is, this is a conversation that, that will continue, without a doubt. Um, and, and it has for the five years that I've been on council and before then. Um, in fact, we read a letter from 1995, and uh, the same issues under Chief McKee were going on then that we're dealing with today. And uh, actually, we probably should pull that letter back out. Um, it's an ongoing uh, challenge. Um, okay, I think we will move into our special reports. And, did we um, vote? Do we need to? Yeah. Yeah, because we're we did vote. Yeah. We did vote because we moved into. I lost the consent. thread there. <laughs> yes. Do you want to take five minutes or just keep moving? Um. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, th I think we're okay. Uh, so, Colleen, I think this is your show. We're going to talk a little bit about the budget. to get an update on where we are standing so I apologize for the small print that's how I um, was able to bring over the software normal monthly reports that you usually get that are that size mm -hmm. and condense it down so we could just get an overview of where we are so the revenue right now and we're into our um, this is as of the end of September and that Pretty much we look for about a 75% target of, of uh, revenue that we've brought in based upon what we've budgeted for, and we are. Our year-to-date revenue is, um, which my last page, $10,062,094.48. Our budget is with our supplementals that we had put in earlier in the year is estimated to come in at the end of the year at eleven million nine hundred and thirty five thousand five hundred and eighty dollars so we're a little bit above we're at about an eighty four percent on collection on our revenue going into our expenditures and this is where we try to watch it a little bit closer um, this time of year to make sure that we're staying within our estimated uh, or our um, appropriations Last page on that one. We have um, year to date expended eight million nine hundred ninety four thousand six hundred seventy one dollars. We also have encumbered one million five hundred twenty seven thousand nine hundred sixty. So that is technically open purchase orders obligations that haven't actually wrote the check, but they should, which brings us to a um, ten million five hundred twenty two thousand six hundred thirty one dollars of our twelve million two hundred four thousand appropriation. So we are at about uh, eighty six percent on the on the expenditures also. Now some of the items that I had put down as a concern earlier on the positive we'll go to the revenue side. Our investments are doing really well. So we'll probably be adding about 50000 more to what we estimated of bringing in on our investments of uh, 30000 to a total of 80000 We'll put that in um, our certificate and get our appropriations, our estimated resources increased. The um, other areas that we looked at, and I had a little bit of um, on the part-time employees. And what I meant, not all part-time park employees, but it was more of the park pool combo. I believe we had, from what our service director just told me, one employee that's been out for most of the year. So some of our part-time employees that we had budgeted in part were doing full-time. So that's what wages got up a little higher than we estimated. And of course, we're estimating a year in advance. And that brought, um, we'll probably, be keeping an eye on the expenditures for the park funds. 
The other wage that I was highlighting was the fact last year we planned for a part-time planning and zoning employee, Denise, which is full-time, so we haven't changed those appropriations. Professional services, um, there was just a few areas that um, we will probably be coming back with a supplemental um, on the next um, council meeting, and that is some additional chemicals that the water treatment plant did not um, have in their estimates last year. We also will be increasing the electric cost. It was under budgeted and possibly, um, possibly I think we're looking at the lawyer cost that we're reviewing. Then uh, the other thing that you wanted me to, or area that you wanted me to comment on was the pool season. And the pool, based, I, I pulled the last three years of revenue and expenditures this year we did lose about 32,000 from what we brought in in revenue. Revenue was $67,387 and the cost of the pool with maintenance and labor and, and everything that goes with it was 100189 Now in, re, in comparing it to 2017, we brought in 110000 in revenue instead of a hundred. But our expenditures were 68. We had a $41,000 loss for the season. And then looking at 2016, we had 113,000 as revenue. Expenses were 67,000 for a $45,000 loss. So we actually didn't lose as much this season. We had a really good um, weather-related pool season. So <laughs> they, uh, the managers are talking about different ways to try to tighten up, maybe be creative on bringing in more rentals for the pool, more programs, but the cost of maintenance and it's, it's just a service that the community loves, obviously, and kind of like a, the parks, they cost money if that's um, where we go with keeping that. So that is what I had um, to present, if there's any questions. You have a question okay. on the, the maintenance costs for the pool. Was that just regular maintenance or was any of that the repairs that were done at the beginning of the season? The, the the um, the capital repairs were taken out of a different line. Mm -hmm. okay. So this is this is strictly what Colina's talking about is strictly mm -hmm. the um, the regular maintenance and, and things that we need the the uh, the chemicals and the things that we need to operate the pool. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. They had some repairs, so that would be in the maintenance of it right. this year. Some unplanned. Things. Yes. Marianne? Well, um, do you anticipate then that we will have a deficit balance on revenue total, total at the end of the year? A deficit the balance? Gen, the gen, in the general fund, Marianne, or yeah. in a particular the, place? Well, the whole, I mean, I'm looking at... An overall budget deficit? Yeah. On the appropriations? Well, the $12 million was budgeted mm -hmm. for total expenses and almost 12 million for total revenue is that I right don't believe at this point we're going to be bringing again there's a couple of areas that I'm going to ask for a supplemental and I think that's common that you you've had those every quarter of last year um, we're, we're, we're it's it's hard to, it's a living, breathing yes, thing yes. that changes daily, but right now, no, I do not believe we're gonna be in the negative. Mm -hmm. Our fund balance that I was checking on for some history, also for the general fund, um, I estimate us ending up for the end of 2018 at two million, we started at three. So we're definitely pulling money from from our general fund. I'm, I'm just kind of relating to that right now. But um, no, not in a negative, not in a deficit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, other questions from council? So the other aspect of this discussion is um, we built in an opportunity to um, talk to Colleen about our expectations for the budget discussion. Um, so I will begin um, by just emphasizing a few things that, that I've already said. One of them being that um, 
it's very important to me that we are really thinking about budgeting for our expenses in a very intentional way. Um, so that we move away from the supplementals, and, and I know that's always been a goal, mm -hmm. but you know, in particular, I recently discovered that the budget line that we talk about every year for sidewalks kind of went away. So we need to, I think Johnny wants to bring that back. Mm -hmm. But you know, everything from when uh, you know, the Justice System Task Force was doing Yellow Springs News ads for notice and comment, I mean, all of these things to the bigger infrastructure needs, we need to really be thinking about budgeting them. And I think we've gotten a lot better. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we stuck to our commission's budget this year, mm -hmm. which I am, am, you know, I think that was great. Um, we've talked about um, the lodging tax and that it makes sense to dedicate that to some certain activities that uh, generate the lodging tax, you know, like costs for events and that sort of mm -hmm. thing. Um, you know, paid parking, you know, I have not forgotten about that. And, you know, thinking about are these the kinds of strategies that can generate revenue and help us address our infrastructure needs. So that's going to be the thing that I'm going to be most interested in for this budget round is, you know, how do we, you know, clearly budget for our needs uh, and plan, and then how can we start thinking about matching certain revenue generation to activities that we need to support for the village. Okay. So um, things that I'm interested for 2019, uh, the police department is our biggest single expense, um, more than half the general fund, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know that there are people who have expressed concern about this, and I've reached out to Patty and the chief mm -hmm. to begin a discussion about that, and the chief has sent me some information, and we'll be working on that. Mm -hmm. I'm very interested in seeing whether it's possible for us to not increase the electric rate as planned for 2019. I uh, think that we should begin having a line item for housing, affordable housing. And, uh, and apropos to that, Home Inc. is here tonight. Um, and I know legal fees in particular, I think, is something that we're looking yes. at. Uh, so I think those are the things that I'm going to be wanting to focus on. Well, I mean, I can echo a lot of that. I think the um, the housing um, thing is great. It's bigger than Home Inc. And there will be a discussion uh, of Home Inc. And so, you know, as I was reading the report that was sent out, yeah. um, that certainly uh, made me wonder, you know, if we did or to what degree did we have funds set aside. I know we talked about the Greenbelt Fund before, and, and then, of course, now with the sidewalk fund, either it's there or it's not. Um, so that was a concern. Um, and I guess overall, I'd like to just see where the commission budgets end up. Um, you know, I asked for a, an update on where we are, and I feel like we're getting, we're, we're running out of money before we run out of year. Um, yeah. You're, you're mostly through your HRC year. Yeah. But. Yeah. Well, so again, so if we need to do a, a look back, because I know that was reduced couple years ago or whenever mm -hmm. three. three years ago so um, so we'll you know so I'm just wondering what things are going to look like uh, over the next couple of months I know we're close to the end of the year but uh, that number got where it is quicker than I anticipated okay mm -hmm. um, I I also support looking at the police budget I'm glad that some conversation has started about that if it is a significant cost. Um, also, as you suggested, you know I've been really focused on utility rates and always wanting to really sharpen our pencils and understand um, that. But also, it's going to be really important to look at the infrastructure costs and go into this planning cycle. I, I think, you know, because of the work that Patty and Johnny Burns and the other members of the village staff have done and are doing, 
I feel like we're going to go into this planning cycle with more concrete information about major projects that might be a focus for the village. So we'll have more specific ideas of when some of these significant expenses might hit. Um, I also think it would be helpful to, and I, I would bet you're already doing this, just looking really closely on line items where there's variance, where there have been historically variance mm -hmm. this year and the past couple of years, just because if there's consistently been variance, then there's something that's not right in the budgeting process. And I would rather have the budget be higher, but realistic. Thank I, you. you know, I'd rather have it be higher and we come in under. Yes. Like, I th always feel like the title of a budget should be no surprises, right? Mm -hmm. So <laughs> that's the other thing, I think. And I, all of this, uh, the other thing, uh, the implication for me is this takes time. And for us not to be so rushed that we can't be actively engaged in the process. And from my history on the budget set that I've done in the past, I've always considered them a not to exceed. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we present the budget a year in advance, the best that we can. Mm -hmm. We have what, 800 line items and, and multiple departments and, and a lot of funds. And, and you're not going to get everything right and you're not going to be able to count exactly. But you do have history and you go with history on the normal things. Mm -hmm. And then you put it into place like the infrastructure. The general fund is, is the most critical one because you, as you realize the general fund can loan to other funds if needed, but you have to protect that general fund. The money has to be there. So before a lot of money gets allocated for other purposes, I'd like to really talk about that infrastructure that Johnny presented and the crew. Mm -hmm. Just looking quickly, there's a half a million dollars worth of items that could be needed next year. Mm -hmm. And that's just the general fund. The other are the enterprise funds, which they are supposed to support themselves. So we have to watch, you know, what our income is and what our infrastructure is there so that we're providing good water, good services for the sewer, the streets, everything that goes with it. So I'm looking forward to working with you and giving you any kind of information, any kind of detailed history so, so we have the answers. I don't always have it with my paperwork up here, but obviously in the office tomorrow I can answer any other questions that you might have. And I, before I forget that economic development fund, I want to nail that down too. Yes, and so. I talked with the, with the auditors about how they do their lodging tax. Is that what you're talking about? No, the, the 120,000-ish that we were told that we had for economic development, separate from the revolving loan fund, and separate from the, the lodging amount, tax. But not on, it wasn't appropriate. Right, yes, right. We talked about okay. That. Absolutely. Um, and how long have you been with us, Colleen? Since June. Okay. <laughs> uh, time May. Yeah, so I just yeah. want to say thanks for jumping in. I really appreciate your energy and, and tackling all this. You're doing a great job. You're welcome. I wish there was more hours, but we'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> it's a busy time, but You're thank you. You're doing great. Thanks, Colleen. Okay. Thanks, Colleen. Thank, thank you, Colleen. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right, so we're going to move into old business, and uh, the first item on old business is the request from uh, Yellow Springs Home, Inc., and uh, I have been tagged to, to kick this one off. Um, I don't have a lot to say. I, I'm curious uh, how we are going to structure this discussion, because I'm not sure that we've uh, figured that out, and there's a lot of implications to uh, what we're talking about. Um, but. I, I will sort of recap one of the things that I heard last time is that there did seem to be appetite for similar to the green space fund, thinking about a fund that would support our uh, housing goals and specifically affordable housing. Um, then we get to this next question of the specific request for Home Inc. Um, so I feel that there are potentially two issues that we need to talk about. and. Um, that's what I'm going to tee up and let other council members uh, express some of their thoughts. Could, yes. Could I apologize first for not having the brief in the packets? I had it written. Um, I was trying to get everything to Judy on Thursday when I got back in from the conference, and unfortunately, that was the one thing that slipped through the cracks. So I apologize that you got my brief late. 
uh, today when I finally got a chance to look at the packet and realized it wasn't in there. Okay. So. And, uh, and I think you'll have an opportunity to highlight some things as well. So, Marianne, you look like you might want to say something about this? Yeah. No? Sure. Okay. Sure, yep. Sure. <laughs> well, um, no. <laughs> I'll have gen some general comments and specific. A question I have, because I'm not clear, it's, and, and I'm not asking for the answer right now, but it seems like there are two requests. It seems like there's one request for a waiver of cap fees and then another request for uh, the capital campaign. I think we've already made the decision about the waiver. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, right. Good. So okay. that was okay. just, and, and the reason why that was in the packet, Marianne, was because that those documents highlight okay. the benefit of okay. the project. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll just, my general uh, comments are that we, the village has said we need affordable housing for several decades and not a lot has been done about it and to the degree that things have been done about it it's been primarily homing primarily home ownership housing with the exception of green met with the exception of some individual people in town who are very generous landlords or are very generous in how they sell their house but at any rate the only organization that's really moving this forward is home inc and um, as people have said, the market will not produce affordable housing. What that means is that the only way we get affordable housing is to have an influx of cash, land, volunteer resources, whatever. Otherwise, it does not happen. And the village does not have at this time the capacity to do such a something like inclusionary zoning that we've discussed. Inclusionary zoning would say, okay, you developer, you come in here and you have to build 20% of your houses as affordable houses. We, that is just not gonna work for us. There are other things we can do and we're gonna do them and we're looking at them and we're involved in them. But one of the things that we can do is put some small amount of our cash into the affordable housing. And the cool thing about doing that is that every time we put money, we the village put money in, it magnifies the money that then goes into the project. Uh, and I think that the documents that they have shown sort of indicate that. But we do the fee waiver and the Federal Home Loan Bank will give, you know, we, we do say 20, 10, 20,000 worth of funds, Federal Home Loan Bank comes in with 400,000 or 500,000. So that money that we, it's like that we put in the seed money and it magnifies big time. So clearly I support this and clearly we have very big budget constraints and it's always, you know, there's always this tension between everything we wanna do and what we can do but we have put housing as an affordable housing as like right up there as a top priority. So uh, I think we, there's, I, I actually am thinking probably it makes sense to wait until next year and put our donation, put our money in at next year's budget as a budget line item uh, rather than putting in the general, taking out the general fund, but I definitely support the capital campaign. So, so let me just ask a question then. If are you then saying that that you would support uh, funding instead of the proposed uh, twenty thousand dollars over three years, or three each of the three years? You, if you're going to wait till next year, you're saying thirty thousand well, for the I, next two years. Probably, probably yeah. yes. We haven't gotten to that point. I think we just talk about that when we do the budget. But given what Brian has said about making sure that we have a line item so we have have appropriated money for a particular purpose rather than just pulling it out whenever we feel like it i think that makes sense to do that and as far as i understand that would work for me okay so Lisa? um what keeps me up at night with 
with the request <laughs> from Home Inc. Um, is the uncertainty of the other affordable housing initiatives that the that the village is trying to move forward? And I, yeah, you know, Marianne, what you said just a few minutes ago was actually really compelling for me, and and it's sort of like our discussion about infrastructure is the timing of the expenditure of funds and how quickly will the village be really moving on on housing on our land you know what i mean that just like some of these big infrastructure projects it's not going to happen next month it's maybe not going to happen in next half of next year so i think that is something really to consider is that perhaps the only way that we can help to support affordable housing in yellow springs right now is is through home inc but the, if if there is only a certain amount of money that we have to spend towards affordable housing i don't think we've really thought about how that's going to be allocated and and when it's going to be needed i i also am really sensitive to the issues other existing issues of affordability in the village like utility costs um, people who are already living in the village rather than f investment towards a future place to live in the village that's affordable the issues of affordability right now and I understand that we are always trying to balance between creating a future and taking care of people right now and that both are important but I do think that we should consider that when we give lump sums to a particular nonprofit, even the most meritorious nonprofit, that we're making a decision about taxpayer dollars. We're in, in essence donating somebody else's tax dollars on their behalf as a council to give to a nonprofit. And I think that's something when we have people that are struggling with utility rates and that sort of thing, that if we can afford that, are we sure we can afford that versus allocating that money in a different way? And, and I don't have a, any strong answers other than I do think we need a fund. And I think that in that fund, just as we're thinking about our infrastructure costs more planfully and over time, we need to start thinking about what kind of financial supports we need to give uplift to affordable housing. So those are the things that are kind of keeping me up at night about this topic. I'd like to address a little bit of what you said. Um, the Housing Advisory Board had a really good meeting a couple weeks ago with um, and, uh, representatives from the school, school, Antioch, Home Inc., the Senior Center, realtors and some builders and from that meeting I got uh, the sense that a possibility exists for a big collaborative housing venture with the people with the groups that I just mentioned and one of the things that was stressed in that meeting is that the village needs to have infrastructure we need to have our infrastructure in place before we can do certain housing things. So in terms of the glass farm, we don't have infrastructure on the glass farm. That mm -hmm. is going to take some time. My sense is it's probably going to make sense for us to focus housing where infrastructure currently exists. Mm -hmm. So in this case, and I don't know the condition of the infrastructure right there on Zini Avenue, but at least it's there. It's, we're not ha the village is not having to spend however or whomever the developer to bring it in. So my sense is that <coughs> if we develop the housing plan, we'll be looking at targeting places where infrastructure exists. Mm -hmm. So that would be a reason for putting money here. In terms of the, the village um, and, and what else the village has, we have the land, the value of the land and the glass farm. And mm -hmm. that's probably the biggest resource we have in terms of thinking about affordable housing. Your other point about do we give the 
$20,000 to something else to help with utilities. Mm -hmm. Or 60, is what, 60,000? 60, 60, I mean, clearly $60,000 is not gonna make that much difference to individual people's utilities. You know, maybe one year everyone's utility costs would be, I don't know how much our total utilities are, but 60,000 is not gonna do it. Now, maybe there's, is there some great utility thing that we could put $60,000 in that would lower everyone's utility cost in the same way that this will increase the value for affordable housing? I, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. And I'm not advocating that it's a, instead of this, we do that. But I do, I just, I appreciate your comments and just think that we, for me, there's always, if you use it this way, you can't use it that way. And just think in a, the bigger yeah. picture. Um, and I was also, you know, I think that the report of the full financial implications that that Patty's presented is, it's a lot of money. It's a lot of money from taxpayer dollars. So I just think it's worth considering very closely. So Patty, if you want to go ahead and take, highlight your main issues related to that. Um, sure, and, and, and first let me start by saying Marianne, I agree with you wholeheartedly that Home Inc. is fully dedicated to a very important mission and that they do a great job. Great. Um, you know, I, I, I would never question that at, at all. My concern is that, um, first of all, that council understand um, what it truly means to give a tap fee forgiveness. And, and then also, um, in addition to that, what the village has given to Home Inc. and tap fee forgiveness or other things over the past several years. I think we went back to 2010 in the document. So um, let's start in those two places. Tap fees, when we give tap fees away, yes, that is revenue that we don't realize. But it's also an expense for us because we still provide all of the equipment, the meters, the installation, labor, all of those things. Um, so we, when we forgive tap fees, we are making an expenditure out of our funds, <coughs> excuse me, to purchase those things, the man, man hours to install them. We are paying for the ads in the newspaper when we forgive the zoning fees and the conditional use fees and all of those things. So there is an expense with those uh, in addition to unrealized revenue. Um, in addition, we've forgiven um, the, the four lots on Cemetery Street um, were sold at 50% at of the appraised value. Um, so that was, uh, I think it was 22,500 per lot that was forgiven um, because they were appraised at 45, it is in the, um, they, it is in the report. Um, so th those things that those are things that you need to understand is that when we're forgiving them it's not just unrealized revenue um, but the other thing that i want everybody to understand is and lisa kind of alluded to this um, when we're talking about infrastructure you have to save money for infrastructure improvements over a long period of time you don't just every year save a bunch of money and then you know, make an infrastructure improvement. Um, we, that's why when, when Melissa and I both first came here, we set up those capital improvement funds because those capital improvement funds, when, where they did exist, didn't have any money in them. And the way that you do capital improvement projects is you put money into those over time until you get to the point where you can afford to do the project. So when we're talking about the glass farm being a few years down the road, the fact of the matter is we gotta save the money to get to the few years down the road to be able to do the glass farm then, or we're not gonna have the money to do the glass farm then. So, you know, there, that, we have to save money over time to do that. Um, the other thing is that in many cases- Can I, can I ask you a question about that? Mm -hmm. If we um, have a developer develop the glass farm, mm -hmm. Wouldn't the developer pay for that? The, the de well, depending on what agreement is made, one of the developer incentives could be that we put in the infrastructure. But if our main going down, say, King Street, isn't large enough to hold the development, then we have to upgrade that main mm -hmm. to get there. Um, you know, if, if, in fact, the, the main we just put in down Xenia may or may not be large enough 
to help with this development. We know that when the right state property is developed, we're going to have to fix that infrastructure. The, the, the infrastructure on the property could be the developer's responsibility or ours if it's our property, depending on the incentive. But we are still responsible for the upgrades to the infrastructure that they come out mm -hmm. to meet. So, you know, these are all things that I think council needs to be aware of. And again, not that I don't believe in Home Inc. or their mission or their goal of affordable housing. I think all of those things are important and I applaud their dedication to, to that goal. But you need to be aware that we have our infrastructure needs that we presented to you as a staff that are pretty severe and need to be addressed. And so when we talk about giving money away, when we talk about <clears throat> um, not raising our rates in, in the manners that we plan based on our rate studies and things, all of these things affect our ability to do these capital projects. So we have these competing goals and values and hopes and dreams, and we have to think about all of these things when we're talking about them. So I felt it was important that you have this information. Again, I apologize that it wasn't in the packet, but. Okay, well, uh, thank you. And I know we have a few folks from Home Inc. that would like to say something. So Chris, <laughs> I guess you're getting up there first. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, Chris Bongiorno, I'm the board president at Home Inc. And I wanna just quickly recognize the five board members, including myself, Gina Gunderklein and David Seitz, our co-vice presidents. Steve McQueen and Jackie Anderson is board secretary. Uh, and we also have Brittany Keller, who is on staff. Um, and Emily is representing Home Inc. in Yellow Springs at the uh, Grounded Solutions Network Conference in Pittsburgh right now, which is about affordability and inclusive housing. So uh, she's doing good work on behalf of the village, uh, but couldn't be here tonight for that. Um, I do want to recognize, first of all, that uh, we, we are truly appreciative of the investments that the village has made in Home Inc.'s projects in the past. Those projects from Cemetery Street, uh, where there was a substantial investment made in the, um, uh, the, the having of the property values and the sale, the, the tap fee waivers on multiple projects, um, those are some of the investments from the village that have made those projects go. And when uh, the, Marianne brought up the point, when those investments are made, they show up in our outreach to additional funders. And Brittany can speak in much more detail having uh, pieced together many thousands of pages and um, grant requests to different organizations. Um, they look at what the local contribution is and in some ways make their decision based on that local match. That's how this capital campaign comes together. We're looking at the local contribution that can make this our biggest project uh, on record go. Um, as we've been considering our strategic plan and our kind of imperative to grow as an organization and meet the needs of more uh, and different housing types in the village, um, we need to look at different funding models. We need to ask people we've never asked before. Uh, we need to ask the village to fund us in a different way than they've supported us in the past. So we do truly appreciate it, but we also, we just know that we need to turn over every stone to find the sources in this case. Um, I think it's clear that, and you guys have all said this uh, in various ways, that the Home Inc. model has worked over 20 years. We've done a lot with a little. Um, and I think that the, the tax base is one way we can look at this, that uh, the public sector has a responsibility to invest in the infrastructure, yes. Uh, how will a vacant piece of land like this 1.2 acres on Xenia Avenue um, turn into a productive piece of land that not only meets the mission of the organization and the, the goals of the council in, in affordable housing, um, but also produce a positive uh, revenue growth on the village <coughs> property tax base. And, we can do that with this project and adding 14 units of housing um, to a one acre site. Um, there's lots more to be said about that. Um, I do want to give the other board members who have come tonight a chance to speak. If you have any direct questions, anything I've said, I'm happy to answer, or we can just speak to more project details or financial <coughs> details as requested. Okay, thanks Chris. Thank you. I'm David Seitz, and I just want to speak a little bit to the soul of, uh, of, uh, of this issue. As a village, we should help fund the Glen Cottages po po Pocket Neighborhood because it will be a microcosm of what we most value. Inclusion, economic diversity, and community for all income levels, ages, and abilities. Now, other cities have created pocket neighborhoods, but our research shows that they have either provided for high-income or middle-income homeowners. 
Glen Cottages will serve several tiers of affordability for home ownership and rentals. The project will offer partially subsidized homes, market rate homes, and rentals, all in the same pocket community. The opportunity here is unique. Glen Cottages in Yellow Springs can become a model for our country. Our housing needs assessment has shown that affordable housing is the best path to economic diversity in Yellow Springs. We're a community that embraces innovation and creativity, but if we don't think about equal access and affordability to all, we are only welcoming creative thought from those who can afford to be here. The history of the village includes a commitment to diversity, inclusion, and social justice. Affordable housing is about equal access and a diverse community. Glen Cottages will provide that model for the village, the state, and the nation. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Steve McQueen, um, board member for Home Inc, as already mentioned, also uh, on the Yellow Springs School Board. And I wanted to get into how uh, Home Inc, first off, uh, already now provides $60,000 annual property tax revenue to support the schools, which is, I'm sure you know, <laughs> extremely important. And so this capital campaigns will leverage more than a million dollars in uh, outside funding to provide affordability subsidies in a project with a total development cost of more than 2.5 million. It sort of goes into what Marianne is saying where you start with this, it'll definitely end up here. And so, and I really wanna to stress too, so between 12 and 14 new units, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, of the affordable housing on a now vacant residential lot. And our high density corridor will conservatively provide more than 10,000 plus in annual property tax revenue to benefit the local schools. Um, add that to if even seven have kids that become students, how beneficial that also can be. So I can't stress more what this not only means to the community, but to the schools, which without the community, uh, would it be nearly as awesome as they are, so. All right, thanks, Steve. Any other comments? Brittany? Hi, I'm Brittany Keller. I'm a staff member at Home Inc. And uh, I wasn't gonna say anything, but I just thought of a few things. Um, I just wanted to reiterate the point that Marianne and Chris both mentioned, which is when we're applying for these bigger grants that make up the bulk of the money that goes into the project, they are always looking for the local layer. Um, it's really difficult, I'm sure as you guys know, uh, doing anything like this in a rural community because these funds are usually set up for more urban areas. And we're kind of already breaking the mold by being able to do them um, of the size that we are. You know, um, doing six, eight, ten units versus 75 or 100 units in bigger cities. Um, I wanted to say that a little less than half of this project would be rentals. Uh, the six units that we're building on Dayton Street right now, we have over 100 names on the waiting list, and that's with very little advertising. So just to speak to the need, um, I know these units would be in high demand just uh, based on the feedback we've been getting. Um, yeah, I just wanted to mention this. Thank Thanks. you. Okay. Um, so, what I've, what I've heard council primarily say today and the last time is that this should be part of our budget discussions. Um, is there, are we ready to make any other decisions at this point? Well, I have a <coughs> question or two. <clears throat> so, Well, I guess the question I want to ask depends on probably the answer to your question you just started to raise. But let me try to phrase it this way. Um, if this fiscal year, calendar year, however you guys looking at it, the three years, ends without a commitment from us, uh, without a firm commitment from us, what, uh, what impact does that have on the project? Is it, does it impact um, the acceptance criteria for some other funding sources, 
or does it change the scope of the project? Uh, I'll let Brittany fill in any gaps uh, if I miss anything here. Um, I think it's very impressive that in the six months or so of our capital campaign from the community, individual donors, and the Yellow Springs Community Foundation, we've passed $200,000 of a $350,000 goal. So we have enough money in hand right now from the capital campaign to purchase the property, which was goal number one, uh, was to get enough money in hand from that capital campaign to acquire the site. Um, beyond that, I'm not sure if any of the pending grant applications are looking for specifically a local match. I guess my answer, if Brittany wasn't here, would be to say it would not throw uh, the project off if a decision was not made until the 2019 budget. Um, any clarification beyond that? Sure. If you're not on the microphone, it doesn't get picked up for right. people who are streaming. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't think it would necessarily squash the project in any way. I think we would still keep moving forward. We'd probably look to fill that money that we uh, have in the capital campaign from the village. We uh, continue to apply through other foundations, maybe um, individuals just kind of keep going the way we've been going um, to raise the rest of the money. Um, probably take us longer to do it, but um, we wouldn't let it ruin the project or anything like that. Um, as far as grants right now that need it, we're applying in December for state finance agents, uh, the Ohio Housing Finance Agency money. And um, that's more of a, you make the case that you're, where your other funds are coming from and show that you have that village buy-in, um, which would be a, you know, several, we'd have different ways of getting village support. So um, it would certainly be helpful. It would bolster our application in that way. Um, but if, if it wasn't something that would be this year or um, we would just push forward and keep reaching out like we always do, <laughs> trying to find foundations and places to support public. So. Okay, thank you. So I have a question that's kind of the inverse of what Kevin asked and that is, are there, is there anything in our budget for the rest of this calendar year that is just crying out to be invested in this that wouldn't be spent otherwise? We're running slightly ahead of where we should be, so mm -hmm. I would have to answer that and say, no, there's not that pot just sitting there saying, mm -hmm. crying out. I have nowhere to go, mm -hmm. um, so. Thought I'd ask. <laughs> okay, uh, Jackie, go ahead. I, I appreciated the question uh, uh, um, from Councilman Stokes about what would the impact be if we were to walk away tonight or even this year without a commitment from the village and maybe um, kick the can down the road to 2019, which is understandable given the, the amount of time on the front end of planning a budget for a local government. I, so I took one class in it and that was enough <laughs> for me. But, um, but what I remember from that class is that uh, if you want to see a community's values represented in black and white, if you want to see whether they really stand behind what they say their values are, look at their budget document. Mm -hmm. And so if you are asking if we can continue um, rallying our own support and continuing to um, gather the support of the local community, which has, um, through the donations that they've given us, practically uh, delivered a mandate um, well beyond an endorsement. Yeah, we'll continue to do our work, but if you move forward much longer with this um, goal and value statement um, in your planning processes and a budget document that does not reflect that in real numbers, then you're going to have an issue of public trust to face. So I wish you your good work much better than that kind of a battle, especially in a community as opinionated as Yellow Springs. So I look forward to hearing what you can, um, if, not, if not bring back to us for this budget year, I really look forward to hearing what you're willing to do in the most efficient way possible with a local expert, a local employer, a local organization that, like I said, the local community is all but given a mandate to, to carry out the work of developing affordable housing. Um, I, I, I really think that that's a great way to reinstill 
um, and to stand behind your word and your value for um, public trust around this value of affordable housing. I would just like to piggyback on that. Um, I haven't heard yet, I don't think, anyone talking about us giving our money away for green space. Maybe that was said, but I haven't heard that. And when uh, the village, right, we have committed $200,000 for green space over a four or five year period. Nor I have I seen a spreadsheet that shows all of the additional hundreds of thousands of dollars, I think it's probably been hundreds of thousands of dollars that this village has put into green space. The, and I support green space, but if, we're, if we can't support people, lower and moderate income people who live in this community to the same degree that we're supporting green space, which it is having an impact on affordability here, that's our bad. If we can't give $60,000 for affordable housing when we're committed 200,000 and we didn't, we didn't demand this kind of presentation and sit around and talk about it like we're talking about affordable housing. And why that is, I've never quite gotten. There's something much more sexy about green space than affordable housing. So I guess that was maybe the fund that I was asking about. I mean, is, if that's an allocated fund, where are we with that fund this year? And um, what is it going to? I mean, it's, it is there because, you know, that's the where Tecumseh Land Trust uh, leveraged the $5 million in, you know, uh, funds to uh, when properties become available to, mm -hmm. you know, protect our, um, uh, our water and, you know, all other parts around the village so that we don't have that encroachment. Um, <coughs> so it's, it's spent when there's an opportunity we, comes along. That. We can't yeah. That's committed. Right. 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 Um, yeah, I, I think Should. I've heard a lot of very compelling arguments. I, I, I don't want us to forget though, what Patty presented and by no means have we not been committed to affordable housing? Um, the village has showed that commitment in a variety of ways. Um, so I, I think it's important to remember that. Um, this is a new request, and uh, I agree with all the arguments I'm hearing about that it's compelling, it uh, jibes with our goals, um, and I think it does make sense for us to continue this conversation mm -hmm. during our budgeting process. I, I think uh, we, we need to look at the overall picture, which is something I heard reflected in all the comments mm -hmm. as well, um, to make a responsible decision. Um, but at the same time, I think that I've clearly heard commitment from all council members around um, you know, supporting this goal along with other goals that we have. Um, but I don't know. I, I mean, personally, I'm not hearing that we're ready to say yes tonight, but I think that the arguments that we've heard are certainly very compelling. Uh, you know, I, I will say uh, that I'm supportive of the effort. Um, I like it when, when Jackie says her comments are humble. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're quite compelling, actually. Um, and, and, I, and I heard you. Uh, when you last spoke and said that this is a, a really minor, relatively minor investment, you know, for what we can gain. So, um, you know, I, I am supportive in, in theory. I can't speak in practice. Um, and I agree that I think this is, this is a small investment. Um, you know, I just don't know whether we uh, follow Mary Ann's suggestion, where we look at it being you know, because if we don't do it this year, I, I understand that that means we need to go 60,000 once or 30,000 twice, as opposed to 20,000 three times. Um, so, you know, it's not my money, uh, but I think we do want to be responsible. I mean, I'm in favor. Um, I mean, I'm, I, this is not a vote. We're not, I'm not casting a vote, uh, but I, I, I think it would be money well spent. Um, and I, since I haven't been asked to vote, I think that's where I should stop. Okay. Did you want to say something else, Lisa? 
No, I'm, okay. I really do think we should continue to talk about it. I think we should have a line item. I think we should have an overarching view with a budget so that we understand when these important requests come up that we are not just always taking requests. It's just not about Home Inc. as an individual organization. It's about the bigger picture. So. Right. And, I, and I think along those lines, you know, to extend for you guys to think about the model, um, similar to the Green Space Fund, we want that to be tied to direct asks. So if there are project costs that are coming up that we can, you know, directly look at year on year, that would be helpful for us to make the decision. Um, and so, because uh, I think one thing that um, I do believe that we are going to do is set aside that fund. And so then the question becomes, what are the needs each year for that fund? I, I think it's okay for me to say that if you'd like to just commit to 20,000 a year forever, that'd be fine, we'd spend it, no problem. <laughs> right, well, and what we might do is do that for the affordable housing fund, keeping in mind that, um, as Mary Ann said, Home Inc. may be the, the most logical player in the short term, but keeping in mind that we do have long-term goals around the glass farm and so forth. Uh, and that's what we want to be responsible about. But this ties directly to the idea that we don't want to just be pulling stuff out of the general fund. We need to plan for everything we're doing and that we're committed to. Thanks a lot. All right. Thank you. Okay, um, so we are going to talk briefly about the Village Manager Search Consultant RFQ. Thank you, Chris. That's not what it is. No, I'm, I'm. Yeah, I'm I don't know what notes are. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and so I think we, mm -hmm. um, we use the standard format um, to plug this in. Uh, really, the question in my mind is, does this cover what we're looking for? What's missing? Um, any other recommendations so that we can get this out there? Um, I have some thoughts. Uh, in the uh, opening statement, I thought it might be good to use the word progressive village someplace. Okay. Uh, I thought uh, mentioning Antioch College, the profound influence of Antioch College. Um, and in the overview of requirement, it talks about candidate, creative job notice placements. I think we should have affirmative marketing in there some way, and I don't know the exact words, but I mean, I think that's partly what we're talking about. We want to have racially, ethnic, diverse people apply. Okay. Um, so, so. Then in services, the 3.1 bulletin, it says um, attract non-traditional and highly motivated candidates. I, I mean, I'm not sure we want, I, I don't know what non-traditional means, but I'm pretty sure we want someone who has experience working in a village or some kind of municipality, not someone who's like led some kind of business or an artist who's never had. So I'm not sure what non-traditional means. It doesn't mean much to me. So okay. I, I read that and I was, and I, and it caught my eye, you know, but, and I think to the previous point, Marianne, when you, thought whether it should speak more to, you know, from uh, diversity, uh, a diverse pool. Now, uh, maybe up front we can be more explicit there, but um, when you request, in, in my opinion, when you're requesting uh, qualifications from several people, you know, that could be a challenging statement, a challenging requirement. Um, and then I think what you do is hope that you get, you know, a wide range of responses and, and not try to be so narrow, um, but, I, so I, but I, I agree with you, but then I thought, well, let's just let the respondents handle that the way they want. Are you talking about the affirmative marketing piece? Well, I'm in agreement, I think, in terms of affirmative marketing, I think being clear there is, but on the, um, the non highly, yeah, non-traditional and highly motivated, I mean, one might interpret that as sort of just being a broad, uh, 
brush stroke where you were including. I, I don't think it tells you what doesn't mean anything to me. Would you like it? Would it would be? So what it so what it means to me, and when we were working on this, what it means to me is that we want to avoid sort of round up the usual suspects, whoever those those people might be, um, and I know that's a really like general term, but there I I think what we're looking for is highly competent people with the correct skills who who may have some non traditional perspectives just that mirror our community. Um, Non-traditional perspectives. Perspectives. So that, that's sort of different to me than just saying Just non-traditional. Non -traditional because I think candidate. at the same time we want people who, you know, we have these excellent skills, understand how to run a municipality, great at planning, you know. I think that's what we were trying to express. So what if we said something like including non-traditional candidates? I mean, I don't know the whole I haven't thought about the whole wording yet. Um, but, I mean, honestly, I do think we need to look at people beyond just the folks that have been career city or village managers. I mean, I, 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 I don't think, I mean, my personal opinion is that we're not looking exclusively at just the people that have X number of years being a city village manager. and you know, have this only this certain type of degree or that sort of thing. Um, so. So you, you think um, we could look at people who have no government, local government experience at all? I don't know if I'd go that far, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay pretty open-minded. Um, but that's, that's my personal opinion. So one way that we could capture it, though, is we don't have to make it exclusively non-traditional. Um, but if that if, if that bothers you, I mean, I. I mean, look at who we have as our village manager right now. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You, <laughs> right, right. You, you need to finish I mean, that statement real quick. <laughs> are, are you non-traditional? I don't know. I, I don't know what you are, but well, you're the kind of person we. How about let's think about it as our police chief. In some ways, I mean, that, isn't that a good example? In some ways, I'm non-traditional, and in other ways, I am traditional. If you're talking about my education experience, I am traditional. How are you non-traditional? In some of the ways that I manage my staff. I mean, I guess the clearer we can be. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, this is a very challenging place to be village manager. I, think. I mean, we have we need to have someone who's very accepting of people who all all know what's right and they all disagree and they're can, all going to tell you right can, but can i i guess my question is right now we're discussing the rfq for the consultant to help you hire that right person. not the yes. job not, not, yeah. not the yeah. job itself that's right. true so but i think we we want them to know the kind of person that we, they need to know the kind of place this is and what this place demands of a village. And I think, so the, re I, I think the rest of the package is meant to, to do that. Yes. that, that's describing you know, what the village is like. If we can need to do a better job of that, we can describe the village, what the village is like. But um, you know, I think it's a good thing when you're asking uh, consultants to, to, to show what they can do for you is to give them the opportunity to do so. If you make it very narrow, I think that's all you'll get is just that very narrow uh, perspective. But if we are broad, you know, they can talk about how they can address the, that broad category. So I have a suggestion. If you say something like, um, shall advertise in traditional places but should also demonstrate the ability to think outside the box for alternative advertising yeah, I think venues mm -hmm. or something like that. And that's you know? where I think a non where I would agree with the non traditional mm -hmm. that we, where they're getting the word out. Right. Because I, I will tell you just even from the ICMA conference, there are a lot of traditionally trained managers who are breaking the mold on the way they do things. So 
you know, I think if you cover both bases by saying, put it in the regular places, but tell us where other places might be that you think we could get the person we need. I think you're covering both of your bases there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I like that. And not, I mean, and I think, I, I really don't think we should limit to just people who are already local or regional. I think I'm always astonished how many people come from the coasts you know, who decide that this is an opportunity, a unique opportunity mm -hmm. to really ha be part of something yeah. mm -hmm. and are willing to give, you know, to move from another region here. Yeah, the, the lifespan of most managers in any given place is five to seven years, so. Right. Um, we like change. <laughs> Say. All right, well, this is good feedback. Um, so we have two choices. We could revise it and bring it back for a final review at our next meeting, or I can take these comments and we can get it out. I, I, need, I want to point out in uh, section 1.0 um, where you say um, that you want your hiring process to be done before July of 2019. Yeah. You, if you want, if you're giving the four month or four week transition yeah, period it, it needs to be done before that because yeah. if the one month would be they got to be here in June and then they have to give notice before that if they have another job and they may have to really relocate it needs to be done by the beginning of May yeah I think you should say so that July 19 date um, needs to be I think reconsidered because I'm trying to get a solid date from OPRS right now Mm -hmm. um, and it could be July 1 and it could be July 15th, you know, but I'm trying to get that date. They don't like to give it to you until six months before retirement, but it will be July. And what Marianne and Kevin and I have been talking about on the transition is one month, and that's what we're working on. So that would mean that person, yes. Okay. Well, and, and we haven't heard that yet, yeah. but that's, that's good to know. Yeah. And uh, I'm willing to notch it up a little bit. Yeah. So I think that makes sense. And, and then the only other thing I'm going to say, and, and I can definitely change at least part of this, but you have it all being in here by Friday, October 26th, which is when my niece is getting married and I will be on vacation. So mm -hmm. Yeah, well that date was based on if we were going to approve it tonight, right. um, but we can also adjust that too. I, so. I'm okay letting you and whoever just take it. <coughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I, all this feedback makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. I want to reflect it all. Um, I definitely like, you know, bringing up our diversity hiring practices. Um, that needs to be in there for sure. Um, I don't want to, you know, put it out there with, that we're exclusively looking for somebody that's, you know, totally different from any city manager and that we can work those dates. So mm -hmm. I think that's all good. Yeah. Um, okay, so then um, I will work with Patty and Judy to get this out um, mm -hmm. in the next week. Mm -hmm. Sound good? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, okay, so the only thing I guess I want to ask related to the Vote 16 local gun control um, piece is having read that, is there anything that uh, people feel we do not have the appetite for? Because uh, um, that will kind of guide some of the things that, that I'm going to, I guess, more specifically bring forward, such as support letters for House Bill 585 and that sort of thing. So, um, so I guess I'd just like to hear any sort of uh, thoughts about caution or, or uh, risk tolerance, I suppose. I appreciate that you did this. Thank you. I support fully. Okay. That's a good comment. I mean, I, I, I absolutely agree. I was... Um, I was in a group of young people recently, and I don't know how, if they were really at answering the question, but the question came up about how many people plan to vote, and it was just, it just struck me that, um, and all of these folks are 18 or older, um, how a few hands went up. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if they just were, you know, it was early, it was, you know, I don't want to raise my hand, but I don't need to tell you that I'm going to vote. So, but it just, you know, if that meant what it looked like it meant, uh, it, it, it felt like a greater uh, sense of apathy than I was comfortable with. And I think what's important about, you know, this Vote 16 is, is you know, by the time you get folks, you know, in their second or third round of voting in elections, uh, 
you know, mm -hmm. at 18, you know, in the, you're in the national elections and things of that nature. Uh, you know, I think so, hopefully some of the apathy, a lot of the apathy has worn off. And, um, you know, I often uh, like to say that, um, you know, I can, I can name some people in my family who have bled, sweated, and in some cases died uh, to give me the right to vote. Um, and I think it, it, uh, it is disrespectful of their legacy, you know, for us to make full, for us to not take full responsibility to vote. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's a big deal and I think we should do it. Cool. Yeah, I, I'm also in support. I had the pleasure of hearing Sean King speak at the, you know, get out the vote rally. And if anything, I would say there's one thing that I don't see on the action steps that he really got me thinking about, and that is to just be very strong activists in helping people get registered and then helping to make sure that everybody can get to the polls, that as, as a council we think of what can we do to encourage getting out the vote, what can we do to help organizations in our um, community that help get people to actually get them there and transportation and coordination and activism to, to get people to vote. So not just to support legislation to allow 16 and 17 year olds to vote, but to do everything that we possibly can mm -hmm. that to assure that a, you know, I mean, I, you know, you know me, right? Go big or go home. 100% of people in Yellow Springs who can vote, vote. You know, I mean, obviously that's probably not going to happen. But what kind of a threshold can we set mm -hmm. and try to hit? Like, just like a fundraising goal, can we say in Yellow Springs as a community, we're going to get out the vote, this percentage of people, and what do we need to do to get it done? And I, to me, that fits with these action steps. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I just think, I think it, I'm, very, I'm very supportive of it. I mean, my parents instilled that in me from an early age. You have a responsibility. And if, if you don't vote, you don't get to complain, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. um, so. Well, I think there's a few obvious ones. Again, you know, I, I'm taking this as sort of a, you know, license to move forward, but I want council to see the letters and the resolutions and that sort of thing as, as is our practice. I imagine there are a few things that Chris and I will talk about when we get there, um, but some of the short-term things, um, I, I'll plan to have some documents for us to look at. Um, Yes, Kevin. We, we all have been talking about voting as opposed to the gun control. We didn't really speak right. on that, but I do understand that there's, you know, some uh, territory you need to be careful with sure. how you tread. And I think um, the suggestion to partner, you know, with organizations who've gone that extra step already uh, is important. Yep. Chris? Uh, the one thing I might add is I don't, uh, you probably looked into it, Brian, because you're usually thorough at these levels. Um, What's the target? Because if there's a May election, that might want to cause this to be expedited in some way. If not, then we're looking at a November timeline. Uh, the other thing I might add is I just went back through my emails. Uh, we did a full-blown charter review in 2015, which I think was the first one that had been done in at least 15 years. Mm -hmm. um, when we went through that process, um, I'm recollecting, Judy, you may recall, I think there were some things that we were going to go back and just kind of take a look at. Um, I'm not suggesting that we do a full-blown charter right. review at all. What I'm saying is we ought to just pull out our charter review notes. If we're going to go to the trouble of putting some charter review language on the ballot, you may want to consider how broad you want to go, although there's certainly an advantage, and this is no mystery to anybody, that if you have a single issue on there, um, it, it certainly makes it an easier uh, ballot consideration for the voters. Um, but the primary thing is if, if we're shooting for a May thing, let's get it done. I think it's a fascinating thing. Legally, I'm fascinated by that, yeah. by the concept. <laughs> um, and I think one other thing I will say is when I read the packet, um, it's interesting to me because I, I think from a home rule perspective, um, I think that it would, I think there, a challenge to a vote within the village would be very, very difficult to overcome uh, on home rule power. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're voting for council people, you're voting for mm -hmm. other things that are purely about what happens here, how, how can one interfere with what, what you want to do as a community? However, the, uh, for uh, school funding, if there's a levy related to the school that's beyond the boundaries of the village itself, gets into the township and other areas, mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure how that would play out. Mm -hmm. So just I say that's just something to keep in mind as the discussion evolves. Cool. Yeah. I, I really appreciate uh, Chris's comments because I've envisioned you know, some process of working with the high school. I mean, that's where, you know, at 10 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> all the villages, most of the villages, 16 and 17 year olds are. You know, a few, I'm sure, go outside the village. But, um, but yeah, those kind of things, the opportunities for education, you know, from a social science, a social study perspective, these are the things you can vote on, and these are the things you can't. Uh, and it would be fun to just walk across the street, <laughs> you know, and vote. <laughs> So yeah. I, I guess I have a question, Brian, and, and maybe you can answer this from your research. So how does the ballot work? So because they're only going to vote on, so for instance, as Chris said, if they're only voting on within the village limits, but there's a school ballot issue on that they are not going to be able to vote on, and how does that work on the ballot? Mm -hmm. I, I think that you already see evidence of that in some communities. For example, if a school district crosses a, a township or a municipal line, so that the, the county boards of election have the ability to figure out where those precincts begin and end. But that does raise another point, Patty, which is something I think that there ought to be some dialogue with the county board of election. Yep early on in the process before we begin to expend quite a bit of energy on it. Yeah, My suspicion would be the county board will say, we won't interfere with that process. If it's elected, we'll, we'll address what happens because they're not going to be in a position where they don't, they don't typically take legal challenges. They get yeah. challenged legally, but they don't initiate them. I mean, I was just curious as maybe there would be a particular ballot for someone who right. is under 18. That would be the simplest way to do it. I'm just not sure if that's the case. Okay. Good. Uh, well, more to come. Thank you. Uh, I also agree this is really important. Um, okay. So uh, let's talk a little bit about um, the open seat replacement process. Um, and uh, we had in our packet a draft of a potential notice. Um, one question that came up for me as, as Judy and I were working on this a little bit is how specific or intentional we want to be um, about this open seat. And I think, uh, and you know, so how specific do we want the notice to be then? And then I think a second question in terms of process is, and this is why we have the charter section. Um, my impression and, uh, I mean, Judy and Chris, you can disagree if you think uh, I'm wrong, is that, um, Judith can participate in the decision. I don't read the charter as saying that um, uh, that it's only you know a vote amongst us four, because the charter does seem to um, uh, sort of contemplate that it's vacated, that that person is gone, and that's not the situation we have here. Um, so anyway, so those were sort of a couple things that I thought we should talk about. Um, so maybe beginning with the notice. Any feedback or thoughts about that? Well, I wonder uh, from a process perspective and this and, and, and whether this should be in the notice. Um, a simple way of approaching the, the, this person sitting in Judith's seat on council would be also to have that person sit in, on the boards and commissions that she's responsible for. I mean, that's a you know, swap one in, swap one out kind of thing. But we ought to talk about, do we want to do that? Or is that going to be the expectation? Because then that, uh, those potential, uh, I'll use the term candidates, need to know exactly what they're getting into. It's not just sitting in council, unless we're saying we're going to absorb those responsibilities or make some adjustments mm -hmm. otherwise. Mm -hmm. Well, yep. it says that, that a minimum of three boards. I don't think we need to mention the specific boards she's doing. Well, for let's say for example, I just I'm not, I don't have a perspective yet, just opinion. I'm just pursuing this. So, in other words, let's say someone comes forward, they have absolutely no interest in discussing justice system issues. 
uh, they could be a generalist but have no passion for that, would we then Re would we all rearrange our commissions to accommodate that person, well, or are we? At this point, we don't. The justice system task force, as it's currently put together, is going to end, right? Well, yeah. use another example. Uh, okay. that wasn't the best example. Yeah. But, but we've also agreed that one way or another, we're going to pursue those goals, but right? Not necessarily that. No, right. I'm not saying who would well, be well, right. Well, let's get let's not get bogged down on the justice. Yeah, that sorry, I picked I right. picked the wrong one, and I should have thought about a commission. And I mean, it, I guess it is an interest in it, is the <laughs> is the ideal candidate to replace any council person, a person who has similar passions and focus. I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know how it's been done in the past. And I think so. I mean, mm -hmm. I think I would like to see someone who, who could step in and represent the kind of uh, concerns that Judith represents. Is that what you're? Yeah, I, yeah. And mm -hmm. in which case, ideally, we probably should be more specific. Ideally, mm -hmm. but okay. And, and I don't disagree with the affiliation of the, the passions and the concerns and the, the the sector of the community, or however you want to phrase that. But at the same time, I'm going to say that. The alternates, uh, liaisons on these boards and commissions have just as much passion for those boards and commissions. For instance, Lisa is very passionate about JSTF and that particular um, venue of, of, you know, pursuing that. So, you know, Judith is also on energy board and library commission. Um, I wasn't so, speaking to the commission. Yeah, I'm so I, the I don't know that you want to be as specific as the boards and commissions, but more in general of mm -hmm. so are we proposing an, uh, an ideally statement that captures some of that well it's interesting that you just had the conversation about the RFQ <clears throat> mm -hmm. because you can go one way or the other with the advertisement mm -hmm. and say we want exactly these things and then that tells me if I would like to have a seat on council that I will come in and tell you that I am exactly those things mm -hmm. if I'm smart about it and if that is not delineated precisely and you are left to grab the nuance, uh, to me, that offers you a better opportunity to see who might best fulfill that role without getting a canned presentation. But it's be so in my view, it's similar to the, the position you took when you looked at that RFP. How much do you want to dictate and how much do you want to let that person show you? I think the statement who are aware of and aligned with current village values yeah. says it. it. Okay, cool. I do think it does, yeah. All right. So are, we're basically good with the notice? Except I, I think I would say participation on council requires a minimum of 10 hours hmm. a week and maybe leave it there. I, you're probably the only person that puts in <laughs> 30 hours. I, I do not. And I did not write that. Oh. Other part, by I, the way. I think that so. would, I'm not sure how many people <laughs> we're going to get. <laughs> yeah, so we don't want to scare anybody yeah. away. <laughs> I'm going to work 30 hours a week and get paid $7,000. <laughs> oh, you get paid? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> 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 Did you forget to put that paperwork? Oh, in, see. <laughs> I, I do think, though, it should say a minimum, that minimum number, okay. and okay. could be more depending on. And do you want to leave in the depending upon your level of, the level of engagement, or do you want to just want to drop it? I think minimum of 10 hours is uh, okay. an appropriate expectation. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, okay, anything else? No. All right, good. So let's, can we get that in the paper this week? Because so. usually we have until noon, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we got it now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Awesome. Here, just hand it to her. Here. Sweet. Yeah. Here. <laughs> Sweet. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. There's always that last-minute phone call. <laughs> um, okay. So uh, I think it's also worth deciding: Are we? Uh, how do folks feel about Judith participating in the final decision? I think if it's tight we ought to have five instead of four yep okay good lisa good mm -hmm. all right so last proposal i will make because we might as well get this out there mm -hmm. um is i think when we select the finalists that they should come to the november 19th meeting give a brief presentation and answer questions at the meeting be as transparent as possible because they are going to be jumping into this seat at the very next meeting and so I realize that that's a little scary, but I think, you know, 
we have an expectation that we want somebody that's ready to go. Mm -hmm. So that is um, what I'm going to propose for a process. And then, um, and I think this is okay, Chris, could we do that at the end of our meeting, go into executive session, discuss, come out, and make a decision? I think that would be appropriate. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, so, so I just wanted to, okay. Okay. So, and you had said something about the <coughs> process being a pretty much council contained process that it wouldn't, perhaps it wouldn't be open. Right. Yeah. Um, my idea is not that citizens would ask questions, but the council would ask questions and then we would have our discussion. Of course, we cannot make a decision in executive session. So we would come out and do that and give any reasons why. Okay. okay. Sounds yeah. good. All right. Great. Okay. Patty, we have no new business manager's report. Okay. Um, uh, you can see in my report the, the public works update. The black topping has been uh, delayed a little bit uh, due to weather, but the installation of the curb ramps is supposed to begin this week. That's the big grant we got through MVRPC. Uh, so that's moving forward. They're still trimming trees. We're still exercising valves. Uh, the rear shelter house at Ellis Park is being, the roof is being disassembled and we're repairing the rafters and then uh, Shook is putting that brand new roof on us for free as their community give back project, which we thought was wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, we're still reviewing the evaluation process and, and different ways to do that and it, it runs the, the gamut of how different people do it. I mean, there are so many different ways to choose. Obviously, we want something different from what we're doing now, but we're not quite ready to bring a recommendation yet um, to council on that. And then the ICMA conference was a wonderful thank you to council. I am <laughs> not a conference person, but I always, always, always find this conference valuable. So thank you for allowing me to go to Baltimore, which was uh, an interesting experience. Um, Marianne, I have lots of notes on the affordable housing and some ideas and some contacts and things that are going to help us with, with that as well as uh, the resilient communities. Kevin, I've already touched base with him about the implicit bias and the, the presenter there has offered to um, consult via email with us for free on next steps and things. Um, you know, the uh, mental illness and turbulent times, being crisis ready, I mean, just all kinds of really interesting things. Lisa, you are going to have lots of fun with the manager from North College Hill because she is so excited about Arts and Culture Commission and the things that you're doing and trying to get a program started in North College Hill. So she's going to want to come up and attend a meeting or two. Cool. Um, and they, they may be up here at Street Fair, in which case I will let you know if they're coming. Um, but, um, you know, they're also going to tour our water plant because they're having some similar problems with their groundwater and uh, the iron and uh, manganese in it. And I'm telling you what, Gretchen DeFonte, the first female city manager in the state of mm -hmm. Alabama, she's been there for one year, one year, and she's the first female manager in the state of Alabama. Wow. Um, sat next to her at a session, uh, Crisis Ready, and she is just an amazing person. And so, where is she? Um, she is in um, Purnell, Alabama. Purnell, Purnell, Alabama. <laughs> and uh, oh, no. she's uh, <laughs> she's just, you know, I, I kudos to her for you know uh, breaking through that barrier. But um, I have lots of notes. So if there's a particular session that anybody wants any further information on, I. I I took lots of notes and uh, I brought set back some information in broadband. I gave that to Scott Fife yesterday. Um, so they have information from USA Broadband, and, uh, which is a government, uh, an arm of the government that um, works with local municipalities that are trying to get broadband up and running. Um, so they, they consult for free and so it's a great source. Great. Thanks, Patty. Mm -hmm. um, Chris? Amplify a little bit about my report. Um, so you know, it's kind of shocking you hear the first woman manager in <laughs> Alabama to kind of remind us every time we think we've come so far and you remind us how much more work we have to do. Uh, and I think that's a good segue for the surveillance ordinance. Um, Alice and I and Jennifer uh, have had four conversations. Um, 
we have had lively discussion because the, the challenges that we've had are tailoring the ordinance to the needs of the village. That was an ordinance that was written for a big city that, that just has different policing methodology and, and, and needs, um, or at least perceived needs. Um, and so, and, and plus we also have to make sure that, it, that it, it fits Ohio law. So in the context of that, and to address one of Judith's concerns, Ellis has gone back to his ACLU contact at least twice, had some conversations. He feels he's closed the loop on that. The last draft I sent to him uh, last Wednesday or Thursday, uh, we are going to speak later this week. Uh, we also think it's important, given the amount of time that, it, that Lisa and Judith and the task force put into it, we want uh, Lisa and Judith to take a look at it. Uh, and then on the, the staff side, Chief, Patty, and Judy need to look at it because we've got public records issues that have to deal with make sure that we, we don't inadvertently create some things that have unintended consequences. Um, you know, it's, it's a cutting edge ordinance uh, and, and uh, we want to make sure we do our best to get it right so we don't have to come back and, and fix it and make sure that when you see it, we answer any questions and concerns that you have. But anyway, the process has been, been going slow but steady and uh, I expect it will be before you at the next council meeting. All right. Thanks, Chris. Thanks. It, Kevin, I'm sorry, it's Pelham, Pelham, Alabama. Oh, okay. But. okay. Uh, Judy? I have nothing. Okay. Um, anything related to future agenda items? Uh, <clears throat> should we have a second reading for the utility roundup? Or is it on there and I missed it? Mm. Yeah, you're right. I got 201831 on there twice, I think, and not, yeah, I just mispasted. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Good catch. It just seems like a lot. <laughs> well, you're looking at a million and one zoning ordinances, but we're hoping some of those might be able to be con condensed a little bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's a lot of zoning ordinances. Mm -hmm. and a lot what of other stuff. Well, I think, mm -hmm. I think she's just talking about the no, number of topics. Right, one of the things that I've been concerned with, and again, I'm, you know, rookie squad down here at the far end of the table, so I know that. But it seems like our meetings go way over time, and I think it's because we're not realistic about how long we're really going to want to talk about things. Mm -hmm. And so just as I was saying about the budget, let's just be real. If we're going to really talk about something for 15 or 20 minutes, let's just put it there and know we're going to be here until 11 o'clock. And if we are, we are. But I just think it's better to be realistic. I noticed this at our last meeting when we had a bunch of agenda items that it was like, this is five minutes and that's 10 minutes. And they were 20 minutes. So, you know, I, I just feel like looking at some of these things like the Justice System Commission discussion, the DCIC, the housing okay. goals. I mean, these are all yeah. things. General plan. They all, all those are going to be long. Days. Yeah. 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 And the gaunt sculpture presentation. I mean, they, these are all. Maybe maybe we should make all presentations uh, catch a kucha presentations. <laughs> so that six, even, but even six if they are. Six minutes and 40 seconds. Even if they are. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. Um, so, I mean, when I think about if we actually look at some of the discussions that, that go way over, they're often not um, ones that we can predict. Um, most of the ones, at least, that I'm involved in are five to ten minutes, but I understand that, you know, we can't do that all the time. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's a balance. I, I guess I'm not willing to write an agenda that's going to keep us here until 11 intentionally so but but we will continue to think more about well, that because I think one thing we could do at the end of a meeting is um, review the meeting so it just even if we just did it in terms of time I mean mm -hmm. like the home ink discussion was definitely more than 10 minutes right it's mm -hmm. sure. more like a half hour mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't I'm not, I, I wasn't really keeping track of time, except I can tell it's really late. But I, I don't know if, that, like, were there any places that we could have done something different? I think it was last. I, I'm reacting more to our la most recent past meeting. Mm -hmm. it seems like that second meeting of the month. Yeah, boards and commissions. Mm -hmm. it yeah. I mean, this meeting was supposed to have gotten over an hour ago, about mm -hmm. by the time. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, uh, it's, it's a point well taken. Um, I mean, I guess honestly, those, those time limits are also supposed to be 
guidance for us to figure out ways to uh, be more directed as well. Um, all right, but we'll continue to think about that. I totally agree. So on that note, I did not ask for this topic to be on old business or anything else, um, but it was um, stated in a previous meeting that I would take responsibility for the projector business. Yeah. Uh, that's been taken over by the CAP advisory group, uh, and I've sent some uh, samples of stuff to members of the group. So CAP has that. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not that I'm encouraging this, but one option you do have is to start earlier on a meeting that you know is going to be a long meeting, so that yes, you will still be here a while, but um, you're instead of being here until 11, you're here until 10 because you started earlier. Um, and but Judy has to know that in order to properly. Well, I with this and it was discussed when this was happening when Karen Wintour was president, and she was really adamant about no, we say seven o'clock, everything says seven o'clock, and there's a public expectation of seven o'clock, and that's where that discussion went. And certainly, there's new leadership and a different council, but that was the argument at the time was there's a public expectation. Okay, well. At one point, we were finishing meetings at 9.30, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. I remember, well. that, I remember that meeting. <laughs> yeah, it's like in January. <laughs> All right. Well, I have some ideas. We'll keep working on it. All right. Um, okay. So, uh, I motion to. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Are we. So.